Good morning. As the designated federal officer of the Agricultural Advisory Committee, it is my pleasure to call this meeting to order. I would like to extend a warm welcome to Chairman Benham, Commissioner Johnson, and Commissioner Pham, and thank them for joining today's meeting. I would also like to thank Commissioner Goldsmith Romero and Commissioner Mersinger for their pre recorded remarks. This is the first AAC meeting of 2023, and I'd like to start off by welcoming our new ACC chair, Scott Herndon, and thank him for his leadership. To ensure that today's virtual meeting goes as smoothly as possible and the recording of the meeting is complete and accurate, we ask that everyone please remain on mute with your cameras off unless you are speaking. When you are speaking, please identify yourself and the organization that you represent on the committee before you begin speaking and signal when you are done speaking so that we can continue with the next speaker or question. If you would like to be recognized during the discussion for a question or comment, please use the raise hand function in Zoom. I will alert Scott that you would like to speak during the Q&A that follows the panelists remarks and presentations. You can also send me your questions directly via chat. To begin the meeting, we are pleased to first recognize Chairman Benham for his opening remarks, followed by the commissioners. Chairman Benham. Thanks, uh, Swati. It, good morning to everyone. Good early morning to some probably in the, in the Midwest or on the West Coast. Uh, really pleased to be here and really appreciate all the work um, that many of the members have done so far. We have a great uh, morning scheduled. And as I mentioned when we last met uh, in December of last year, um, I was so pleased with the contributions and the ideas that were shared by the members. So my goal here for 2023 is to discuss as many issues as we can and then certainly continue that into 2024. But here we are, um, you know, just a few months after the last meeting, we're going to have a nice, short, but very efficient meeting with three different panels uh, and then continue this work throughout the year. Um, and I think we're going to really have a, an opportunity to dig into some of these issues and really just encourage the, the committee members um, to keep sharing with us your views, your interests, and how we can best accommodate and facilitate, um, you know, a healthy discussion around these issues, and then potentially um, come up with policy responses from the commission, or at least recommendations to the commission. So with that, um, I certainly want to thank um, Swati uh, as our new DFO. She's going to be fantastic, and I'm sure many of you have been working with her in the past few weeks, but certainly in the past month or two. Um, and really pleased with her willingness um, um, to, to be DFO. And I think she's going to lead the, the committee in a very positive way. And of course, a huge thanks um, to Scott um, to be chair. This was obviously an incredibly important role. And I appreciate Scott stepping up um, and offering um, his services to the committee and his experience, uh, which I think will be invaluable. Do want to recognize and thank my uh, fellow commissioners for joining um, some in person, Commissioner Johnson sounds like, and Commissioner Pham, and we'll hear some brief remarks from Commissioner Mersinger and Goldsmith Romero. I also do want to recognize we have some guest speakers. We're going to have, as I mentioned, a great panel. We're going to kick it off with Sarah Menker, who's the founder and head of Grow Intelligence. It should be a really fascinating conversation. Um, about ag markets generally from a macro view. Um, so really excited about that and appreciate Sarah's time. Also, uh, Kathy Bergren, Devin Mogler, Alexa Kombalik, uh, and John Duff, who we'll hear from in the middle uh, of the meeting. And then a real special thanks to the Honorable um, Dan Maffei, Chairman of the Federal Maritime Commission. Um, Dan's a friend, and I think it's going to be a unique opportunity for us to hear from the chair of the Maritime Commission about some of the issues that he's dealing with uh, on a global scale, but given his expertise around maritime issues and the importance of shipping, which I know is an issue of importance um, for the, the committee, uh, it'll be really helpful to hear um, from, from the chairman. So looking forward to the, the morning, looking forward to engagement questions uh, from the group, but uh, above all else, I wanna end with this. I wanna thank every single member of the committee um, as you know, I say this all the time, your time, your service uh, is important public service. It's a great service to the commission and the country. We appreciate you um, spending time and sharing your views because this is the way we can do our job better at the commission so that we can improve our rules and the way we think about agriculture, production agriculture, and how our markets impact your daily lives. 
um, obviously a diverse group and one that I'm very proud of that we were able to convene. Uh, but again, couldn't thank you all enough for your continued support and commitment to this committee, to the agency and the country. So with that, Swati, I'll hand it back over to you and looking forward to a great discussion this morning. Thank you, Chairman Benham. Now for pre-recorded remarks from Commissioner Goldsmith Romero. Good morning. Americans just celebrated the 50th National Agricultural Day. So my biggest message to you today is thank you. We celebrate your contributions to the American economy and global economies. Now, it used to be that when someone turned 50, there was a big party. So a virtual meeting today seems not enough to celebrate this milestone. I think it would have been fitting if we had a celebration today, at least some cake, to thank you for feeding our nation and driving our economy. So I'll talk to Chairman Bedham and ask him if next time he can get you some cake. And let me also recognize him and thank him for his sponsorship of AAC. The ag sector has faced severe headwinds over the last three years. Pandemic related supply chain disruptions, labor and transportation shortages, and Russia's war on Ukraine that impacted energy and food prices and market volatility have brought unprecedented challenges. I'm glad to have had the chance to meet with many of you to hear about the specific issues and challenges that you have faced. International shipping is a challenge that I have heard from several groups. And when I toured Michigan's largest grain handler, Michigan Agricultural Commodities, Inc., I met with two twin brothers who took over the business from their father. And they ship soybeans to Asian countries for tofu and other food products. So they told me about the problems they had and uncertainties that they face with trying to ship internationally. Uncertainty about the availability of the Black Sea Corridor and access to China during the, the lockdowns, concerns about ship queues and congestion and unpredictable shipping have had very real impacts. Freight rates soared, and there were concerns about shipping companies taking advantage of the situation. It's one thing to read about shipping issues for me, but it's another to stand on the loading dock with them looking at the food that needed to be shipped as soon as possible. I look forward to hearing today from the chairman of the Federal Maritime Commission, who recently testified before Congress that the ocean freight transportation system is much improved and that the ship queues and congestion that overwhelmed the supply chain for approximately two years have dr drastically dissipated and that costs have gone down to pre-pandemic levels. I hope that is providing much needed relief to our farmers and producers. I'm also in interested in hearing about his commission's enforcement actions to keep freight and fees fair. I wanna commend our agricultural community for their grit and resilience to provide food, fuel, and fiber and drive our economy during these challenging times. I also look forward to the discussion on sustainable biofuel. Prior to coming to the CFTC, my experience related to biofuel was, is, was in ensuring that SIGTARP's law enforcement fleet met the federal requirements for the E85 fuel blend. And this year, I was able to tour a biofuel plant that produces 53 million gallons of ethanol annually, consuming 18 million local bushels of corn. They spoke to me about reduced emissions, showed me their total water recovery system, and also the livestock feed byproduct. The Biden administration announced Department of Agricultural efforts to boost homegrown biofuels to enable energy independence and bring relief from rising fuel prices uh, when they were rising in the spring and last spring, and the Department of Energy funding for biofuel production. I'm interested in committee members' views on these and other efforts on biofuels' ability to reduce carbon emissions and in understanding the market better for biofuel derivatives products. I'm glad that we are speaking today about issues that are foundational to our commodities and derivatives markets. The derivatives markets have served as a critical tool for our farmers, ranchers, and producers to manage risk during these unprecedented times. And as advisors to the commission, you play an important role and I very much value your opinions. Have derivative markets been adequately serving your needs? Are there additional actions that you believe the CFTC should take to promote market resilience, vibrancy, and integrity? 
I look forward to hearing your thoughts on these important issues and extend my great ap appreciation for the 50 years and more. Thank you. Swati, you're on mute. We thank Commissioner Goldsmith Romero for her remarks and now for pre-recorded remarks from Commissioner Mersinger. Good morning and thank you to all of the participants joining today to take part in the second Agricultural Advisory Committee meeting under Chairman Bennon's sponsorship. Given the fascinating presentations and the level of discussion during the previous AAC meeting, I expect today's meeting to be just as robust and informative. We learned so much from the CFTC's advisory committee meeting and the time and effort advisory committee members and presenters put into their presentations is greatly appreciated. Their contributions are invaluable. The topics you will cover today are of critical importance and I'm very intrigued by the discussion around sustainable biofuels production. I've watched firsthand how the growth in the biofuels industry has changed the trajectory of production agriculture, my home state of South Dakota. In fact, it will be 21 years this month since my first on-site visit to an ethanol plant in April of 2022. This particular plant is in Wentworth, South Dakota, and it was and still is an investor-owned venture with the producers and community as the investing members, creating a new and exciting financial for the small rural community and the many farm families residing in the area. At the time of my visit, I was struck by how proud these individuals were to be a part of this process. Not only were they a part of an effort to create a more sustainable, renewable fuel for our economy, but in their part to end the United States dependence on foreign sources of oil. More recently in 2019, a dry mill biofuels plant in my hometown of Oneida, South Dakota, began producing biofuels. This plant anticipates using 25 bushels of corn a year to produce 70 million gallons of ethanol. In addition to the biofuel production, this mill will also produce 12.5 million pounds of corn oil. Economic development in small towns like Oneida has been an ongoing struggle and projects like the new ethanol plant are vital to the long-term survival of the rural economy. I'm also looking forward to the other presentations today around data and analytics, as well as a deeper discussion into the waterways issues that impact the movement of agricultural products to reach international markets. Access to foreign markets is vital to our farmers and ranchers, and constraints in getting products to these markets has significant impacts, not just on the U.S. farm economy, but on the world economy. Thank you again to all the presenters, the advisory committee members, and others joining in today's meeting. I want to say a special thank you to the CFTC team for ensuring that we can host these meetings. And I also want to say a quick welcome to Swati Shaha, the new designated federal officer for the AAC. I've been very impressed by Swati and my interactions with her through her role in our division market oversight. And I'm certain she will impress all of you as the designated federal officer of the Agriculture Advisory Committee. Thanks again to Chairman Benham and to the AAC members for this opportunity to greet you this morning. We thank Commissioner Mersinger for her pre-recorded remarks. Um, so at this point, Scott, I'm gonna turn the meeting over to you. Great. So thank you so much, Spotty, and thank you, uh, Chairman Benham, Commissioner Johnson, Commissioner Goldsmith Romero, Commissioner Mersinger, and Commissioner Pham. I'm honored to be a member, a member of the AAC, and now serving as the chair. Well, the committee serves an important role in helping the commission in identifying and assessing issues affecting agricultural producers, consumers, processors, lenders other major market participants, including derivatives, intermediaries, buy side representatives and exchanges, regulators and others interested in or affected by the agricultural derivatives markets through public meetings. Today's meeting serves as a timely opportunity to discuss markets, sustainability and biofuels production and shipping, as well as other topics the commissioners or members raise. 
Now, Chair, I look forward to facilitating the discussion of the members' perspectives to the AAC and working with the AAC members to provide the Commission with feedback and recommendations that assist the agency in its oversight of our markets. To ensure that today's discussion is consistent with the AAC Charter, no determination of fact or policy shall be made by the AAC on behalf of the Commission. Determinations of action to be taken and policy to be expressed with respect to the reports and or recommendations of the AAC shall be made solely by the Commission. So now before we begin our first panel, we'd like to do a roll call of the members and guest panelists. So we have your attendance on the record. Swati, uh, Swati will lead that roll call. Thank you very much. Before I proceed with the roll call, I'd like to check in to see if Commissioner Johnson has been able to join us. I think we are having some technical difficulties. Um, we'll proceed with the roll call. Can you, can you hear me, Swati? We can hear you. Thank you. Thank you so much. I am uh, surprised, surprisedly joining you from Nairobi, Kenya. I apologize for the technical difficulties uh, logging in. Um, if you could see the configuration that I've used in order to connect with the meeting today, um, you would know how much it means to me to be present. I want to thank each of the members of the AAC for joining and Chair Benham for his leadership uh, of the AAC and Swati for her service uh, as DFO. Uh, I'm excited to talk lots about the issues that you're covering today uh, in large part because they have been the substance of the discussion here during my visit in Nairobi, Kenya. I have had the great and distinct pleasure of meeting with um, professionals across agricultural markets and uh, among the largest regulators uh, here uh, in Kenyan markets as well as in other regional markets in the area during a visit. Um, that we aspire as a result of significant efforts by the Office of International Affairs might lead to a project and technical assistance. Uh, what I can share is that there is a mutual path to learning about the very topics that are the focus of the agenda today. Biofuels and data at, are at the top of the list here in Kenya as this, uh, much like our own country, is a country uh, deeply committed to the agricultural economy. Uh, the agricultural industry and its contributions to the economy. I have had the great pleasure of spending time and will happily post pictures to Twitter uh, of my visits uh, with Maasai farmers. I had the great pleasure of herding uh, a Maasai cattle uh, the very old fashioned way with a spear uh, and a stick. And I have to share that it was exciting and as fun as my ability to do the same uh, in central Texas when I visited a farm uh, and a ranch there last summer. I think the conversations happening today are important conversations that really are at the heart of the development, continuing development of our markets. And so I'm sad that I cannot be there with you, but I'm hopeful that you would appreciate that I'm wearing my ambassador's hat on behalf of the CFTC. And I'm hopeful that uh, many of the lessons that we're learning, um, we can share here with the agricultural uh, sector in Nairobi, Kenya. And many of the lessons I'm learning here in Nairobi, I hope to bring back uh, to the United States. I'm grateful for your service always and for your commitment to improving our uh, understanding at the commission. Uh, and certainly for me as a commissioner with limited personal background in this sector of the economy, I've just gained so much, learned so much from each of you and your service and so many in the market. Uh, I hope to continue expanding my understanding as a result of the presentations today. And I look forward to the opportunity to spend time with you once again when I'm back uh, home in the United States, headed back tomorrow, in fact. Thanks so much, Swati. Thanks so much, Chair Benham. And thank you so much, AAC members. Thank you, Commissioner Johnson. We will now proceed with the roll call. AAC members, after I say your name and organization, please indicate that you are present please make sure that your phone is not muted. If we are unable to hear your response, please send me a message via Zoom chat to confirm that you are present on today's call so that I can correct the record. Buddy Allen, American Cotton Shippers Association. Present. Timothy Andreessen, CME Group. Joe Barker, National Council of Farmer Cooperatives. Present. 
Chris Betts, Michigan Agribusiness Association. Present. Robbie Boone, Farm Credit Council. Present. Lane Carlson, Minneapolis Grain Exchange. Present. Robert Chesler, United Dairymen of Arizona. Present. Jerry Corcoran, Futures Industry Association. Present. Patrick Coyle, National Grain and Feed Association. Edward Elfman, American Bankers Association. Present. Edward Gallagher, National Milk Producers Federation. Thomas Haig, National Corn Growers Association. Present. Thomas Hayden Jr., Commodity Markets Council. Present. Scott Herndon, Field to Market. Present. Thomas Hogan, Cocoa Merchants Association of America. Present. Jared Hooker, American Soybean Association. Present. Brian Humphreys, National Pork Producers Council. Present. Willis Kidd, Citadel. Present. Jeff Lloyd, Archer Daniels Midland. Present. Michelle Mapes, Green Plains, Inc. Present. Mark McCarg, American Farm Bureau Federation. Present. Aaron Morris, USDA. Dr. Cynthia Nick Nickerson, USDA. Present. Edward Prosser, The Schooler Company. Present. Michael Ricks, Cargill. Present. Bella Rosenberg, International Swaps and Derivatives Association. Present. Troy Sander, National Cattlemen's Beef Association. Present. Liam Smith, Futures Industry Association Principal Traders Group. Present. Stephen Strong, North American Export Grain Association. Kurt Struber, Grain and Feed Association of Illinois. Present. Justin Tupper, U.S. Cattlemen's Association. Hayden Wands, American Bakers Association. Ryan Weston, American Sugar Alliance. Present. Jason Wheeler, USA Rice Federation. Present. We also have several guest panelists today. After I call your name, please indicate that you are present. Sarah Menker, Grow Intelligence. Present. Kathy Bergren, National Corn Growers Association. Devin Mogler, Green Plains, Inc. Alexa Kambilik, American Soybean Association. Present. John Duff, National Sorghum Producers. Present. And Chairman Daniel Maffei, Federal Maritime Commission. Thank you. Now I will turn the meeting back over to Scott. Swati, just to make sure you saw that Justin Tupper said he's present in the chat box. So just make sure the record reflects that. Thanks. Do. Thank yeah. you. Thank you, Swati. Uh, for our first presentation today, we will now hear from Sarah Maker, founder of Grow Intelligence. Sarah, now turning it over to you to start your presentation. Thanks so much. Uh, thank you, Chairman Benham and, and Swati for the invitation to present um, to the advisory board. Um, I think somebody's going to share my slides um, as I sort of talk through, you know, this presentation is really meant to be a discussion on sort of the main macro themes that we see um, as a data and analytics company around sort of global ag markets and really sort of the, the state of global ag markets as, as, as we see them um, through sort of multiple lenses. And so 
in terms of sort of structure, what I'll do is I'll go through um, an agenda that covers, can you go to the next slide, please? An agenda that covers um, just a macro overview of, of where we are um, as, as, as a market, um, covering things like food inflation globally, um, the link to debt, fertilizer markets, where the market's positioned today, and then jump into a conversation on what we see from a supply side, really just doing a quick sort of global sweep of as many regions as possible, um, and then sort of going on to the demand side and what we sort of see as two major themes, which is the reopening of China and, and biofuels. So um, next slide, please. A next slide. Yeah, perfect. So, you know, one thing to sort of keep in mind is, you know, really that while the narrative around food and food inflation seems to be dwindling, it's still a pretty persistent and global problem. And it's being driven by two things, right? It's a combination of increases in global ag prices really over the past three years. Again, not since the Russia-Ukraine war, not since COVID, that journey started before. Um, as well as changes in local currency moves due to the strengthening dollar. Um, that obviously only got exacerbated by the Russia and Ukraine war, but, but frankly, a lot of those price moves have sort of reverted back to pre-war levels. And so what you're seeing here is a map that looks at agricultural price changes in local currency since the start of 2020. And so what this looks at is uh, it's, a, it's a consumption weighted um by country view of how much prices have moved of a mix of essentially corn, wheat, soybeans, rice, and a mix of, of vegetable oils, again, weighted by consumption. And what you'll see here is that, you know, places like the U.S. are still up 66 percent over the last sort of three years, whereas if you look at, you know, regions such as Africa, for example, where in Sudan, because of currency moves, that number is really 2,000%, or Syria, where it's 700%. Turkey, which has obviously been playing a huge role in sort of um, Europe and and um, and sort of the, the 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 role it's played in the Black Sea Initiative, you know, prices are up 422% over the, sort of the last three years. So, you know, the the food inflation story and problem is really persistent. It's very global and can lead to a series of risks that are not being, frankly, discussed at, at sort of the level they should be. So if we go to the next slide, a slightly sort of different view of, of this, this, um, this, this chart is just looking at Egypt, for example. So if you look at imported wheat prices into Egypt, while you know, wheat futures are down 45% relative to their 2022 highs, Wheat import prices into Egypt are essentially almost at their all-time highs. They've come off a little bit as, as the dollar has sort of weakened over the past couple of weeks. But, you know, essentially, <laughs> that's all driven by the Egyptian pound. Um, and so really, while wheat futures are down 45%, which is sort of how, you know, the world, again, benchmarks, the reality and the physical reality on the ground in many parts of the world is shifting and has shifted drastically and, and has not reverted back um, to pre-war levels. If we move to the next slide. This is an even sort of more nuanced view of the first map that I showed, which what you see is on the um, on the y-axis is essentially those price changes. And, and frankly, we have to put them on a logarithmic scale because of just how much prices have moved um, you know, over sort of the past three years. And then on the x-axis, what you actually see is um, outstanding debt that is a foreign currency denominated that's maturing in the next two years. And obviously, this is normalized by looking at it as a percentage of GDP. Why this becomes important to look at is that food is imported in dollars and the currency uh, and the debt repayment is also going to happen mostly in dollars. And so where do you use your dollars for as a country? To import the food or to repay debt or to default? I mean, if you look at a country like Argentina, which is far out, I mean, Lebanon is by, by most the furthest out. So 
red dot um, resembles countries that are net importers of food, and the blue dot resembles countries that are net exporters of food. So from a food security and sort of risk standpoint, obviously, importers versus exporters have slightly sort of different um, risks associated with it. But we see what's already happening in, in Lebanon today, right? And so when you start to see countries like Turkey, Tunisia, Angola, Sri Lanka, Egypt, start to sort of bubble out because of, again, this foreign currency denominated debt issue that, that frankly didn't exist during the last sort of, you know, 07, 08 crisis, because the fundamentally markets have changed in terms of um, issued foreign currency denominated debt by countries, which were mostly done through the markets and, 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 and market mechanisms. This can start to lead to political instability if we do not start to also start to address the foreign currency debt situation um, in a lot of um, emerging economies and countries, especially when you look at it through the lens of, again, of these countries, what percentage of total expenditures go into food expenditures, right? So if you're looking at countries in, in sub-Saharan Africa, you're looking at food expenditure being 50, 60 percent of total expenditure for a household. Um, next slide. So that's sort of from just a macro and price standpoint. Now, on the positive, fertilizer prices, which um, you know had been a massive issue in, in 2022, um, continue to decline. And this is an index that we've developed, which is called the Fertilizer Affordability Index. And this is looking at the US in particular, which looks at the relationship between the input costs and crop prices has bounced off the record row, low readings for affordability from mid 2022. So as you can see, this, this chart goes back to, to 2015. Um, and it's essentially sort of reverting again at that, that trajectory over the past few months means that, you know, we should should expect to see um, increased consumption of macronutrients um, relative to last season as a result. That is good. Um, but again, affordability continues to be an issue in, in regions where there is a currency crisis, because again, that gets imported in dollars. So this is a very US-centric view, but really matters a lot, obviously, given the, the role that the United States plays in, in sort of global ag markets and the exports of, of, of agricultural products. Um, next slide. You know, uh, this is this is a view of actually uh, fertilizer, essentially uh, production costs and plant, plant capacity from a global level. So if you look at the red bar charts, that's where we were in the highs of basically fertilizer um, production costs due to natural gas prices skyrocketing and LNG prices skyrocketing last summer. Um, and so we've gone, you know, in a world where in the EU and in, in Europe, um, you know, in the UK and Japan, Korea, where LNG is sort of the source of gas, where that affordability factor um, has has significantly increased, right? So production costs of um, of ammonia fertilizer and retail price relative to retail prices have significantly normalized. And what you see is the line chart that goes across is essentially the 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 retail prices, um, the current retail prices in the EU and the US. And so you'll see that, you know, essentially because of that, operating capacity has has gone back up. So last summer in Europe plants were operating at 30% capacity rates. They're now operating at 70%. So not fully back, uh, you know, at 100%, but essentially in significantly better conditions than we were um, last summer. So this is sort of just um, going through, again, the fertilizer piece of the equation. Next slide. So now we say, how is the market positioned? And this is just, again, a very sort of quick view using CFTC data. Essentially, you know, we see a market today that where speculators are short wheat and bean oil, but long soybeans and soybean meal. And on the other hand, producers are very short soybeans, soy meal and bean oil. And why does this matter? As we sort of go into the supply and demand conversation, I think will be an interesting um, lens to have. So if we move to the next section, which is on just a, a view of supply and agricultural supply and where we see it today. Um, next slide. And you can skip that next one too and move to the next. Perfect. So we're actually at a critical moment for world wheat production. So again, as I showed sort of in the charts earlier and sort of mentioned, um, you know, wheat futures are down 45% since their highs um, last year. 
Today, over 75% of world wheat production is currently planted and growing. What we also know is drought in wheat growing areas is actually at over a 20 year high across in season wheat growing regions. And this is looking at our drought index weighted to regions that are currently growing wheat. So you'll see a list of the countries here that are currently in sort of their growing season weighted by wheat. You know, this obviously is, is, is shocking because it's not a narrative that's sort of being shown, but essentially what that what you know what you see is the red line is where we are in 2023 today you know relative to the last again this these charts go back 20 years so all the gray lines are are the last 20 years and then the blue sort of line is where we were in 2022 so we've never seen this much sort of persistent drought um across again 75% of the world um world's wheat producing regions and so we'll sort of go you know, further into each region um, a little more, but I think important to set the stage here. Next slide, please. So this is obviously happening at a time when global wheat inventories are actually still very tight. So this is the stocks, this is a chart of the stocks to use ratio of just the major wheat exporters. So again, given that wheat exporters are really all we sort of can look into in terms of, um, what is sort of available in the market for for purchases you know stocks to use ratios are not as low as what we've seen before but they're still you know tightest level since 08 um, when measured as a percentage of annual demand um, major exporters obviously um, it's sort of listed here and this is also happening in the context of planted area in Ukraine this year is actually down 20% year on year. This is fundamentally different from where we were last year, because last year we had an issue of getting grain out, but um, the planting had already occurred at the start of the war. So this year you have actually acreage declines that have um, occurred uh, fundamentally because of the war. And that's where we're starting to see that play out now. So next slide. So if we now um, sort of say, let's park the wheat conversation and then look at what's happening in the U.S. Um, sort of just, and then we're going to go region by region in terms of what the main themes are. I think one of the major themes in the U.S. is snow depth could delay corn plantings. I mean, we have just never seen uh, snow levels this high. Uh, and this is looking at, so the first the first um, chart on the left is basically looking at corn area weighted snow depth. Um, and you'll see go, this goes back again to 2000. We haven't seen snow depth of this level. Uh, when you look at the Dakotas, which have had significant prevent plant issues, um, you know, last year and in 2019, uh, these, you know, snow depth levels or levels really we have frankly have not seen. Um, but this this issue is persistent pretty much across the corn growing um, regions across the U.S., but the Dakotas and the Northern Plains really standing out. So this will certainly lead to delayed corn planting, but can also start to create um, significant uh, prevent plant issues um, as sort of the season progresses. Next slide, please. And then in the Southern Plains, um, you have the opposite, which is drought sort of continues in, in 2023. And so again, this is looking at the grow drought index, but this time it's weighted by um, NAS, NAS's winter wheat area um, and masks. And so you'll see that, you know, 2023 levels, um, the red line is running above 2022 levels. Our um, in-season red winter wheat yield forecast model currently points to yields as poor as last season, which was already a 15 year low. Um, and, you know, the most recent uh, good to excellent condition um, data that was released currently shows that, you know, those conditions are 2% below last year. So our forecast model seems pretty consistent with what we're seeing in the good to excellent conditions reports as well. Um, and so Northern Plains, too much, uh, <laughs> too much snow, Southern Plains, um, too, too much drought. Um, next slide. Then we move on to South America. Um, so Argentina, corn, soybeans, uh, both, you know, drought conditions really sort of significantly impacted both corn and soybean yields in Argentina. And this was obviously due to third year of La Nina, which we're gonna come out of, but you know, our, our models had projected lows for both Argentina corn and, and soybeans. So looking at 
5.3 um, 83 tons per hectare for corn and 2.2 tons per hectare for soybeans. Sarah, Sarah apologies. Yeah. I, I just wanted to recognize uh, Commissioner Johnson. I know she's want to get her question before she goes out of service. Sure. Sorry, Chairman Venom. <laughs> no, I can't see anything. So glad for yeah. you to be interrupted. It looks like we lost her. All right. I'll, I'll get the question later. Um, we can go back to the slides. All right, so South America um, is talking about sort of drought. Um, and so what you see here is the blue line is sort of where our projections were running throughout the growing season. Um, and the adjustments, obviously, that had been made by the USDA over the past few months are, you know, um, soybean yields are now pointing to actually slight improvements towards the very tail end. Um, so slightly higher than sort of USDA estimates, but frankly in line. Um, and then with corn yields, um, slightly below. Um, so, you know, again, Argentina has had significant sort of issues, but then the, the positive out of South America has been Brazil. Uh, if we go to the next slide, um, we'll make up for the lost production um, from Argentina. And that's sort of seen in the next, um, if we move to the next slide. Yeah. So, Brazil is expected to produce another record corn crop this year. So this, this is supported by both an increase in planted area as well as um, healthy yields. So our um, yields, um, our current yield forecasts are running at 5.72 uh, tons per hectare. Again, there's a confidence interval. These, these models update every day and with new information and environmental data. Um, but it's up significantly from last year's final projection of 5.34 tons per hectare. So again, a combination of increased area and increased yield will definitely help balance out Argentina's drop in corn production um, and, and, and will tie into sort of the demand story and, um, and as, as we sort of tie in um, to demand later on. So now let's move to the next region, China. Um, so in China, you essentially have a continuation of the drought theme. So this is mostly in rice and wheat. Um, record levels in wheat and rice growing regions across China for drought. Um, this obviously becomes increasingly important to monitor because China is increasingly becoming reliant on global grain imports. And so the volumes that we're looking at in terms of import needs are significantly higher than where we were you know, even four or five years ago. Um, and so looking at growing conditions and, and sort of yields um, is really important. But, you know, from an Asia standpoint, China is certainly sort of the big story. There's heat stress coming into India. Um, our models are not reflecting as, as much of a, a hit to potential yields as, 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 as some of the numbers out there. Um, in China, again, it, it's actually not reflected in the yields yet, but I think a lot of that will start to sort of play out in the next month. Um, and so, but looking at just fundamental sort of drought levels over the last 20, 23 years, um, we're looking at levels that are highest than what we've ever seen um, in, in wheat, significantly sort of higher than last year and much worse than last year, um, but the highest in the last 20 and, and, and the same goes sort of for rice. So uh, next slide. It's an identical story in, in, in Europe. Um, and this is obviously matters quite a lot given the context um, of the war um, in, in the Russia-Ukraine war, but this is looking at the drought index uh, weighted by wheat on the left-hand side and weighted by rice on the right-hand side. So you will see that in both those cases, it's sort of far beyond um, levels we have actually ever seen at this time of the year. Um, and this is obviously really important given that the wheat crop is currently coming out of dormancy. And 
So um, where this starts to sort of have effects is, and one thing to keep in mind with rice is that rice has not been a part of the, 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 the conversation over the past few years, because we've actually had a series of very healthy sort of global crops on, on, on rice. Um, and this is sort of the first year where we're starting to see real threats to it. After a year last, like last year, where uh, a lot of the major exporters did, um, you know, use rice from inventories for export needs, and, and regions like Sub-Saharan Africa are huge consumer, like China, having record um, rice drought um, combined with regions like the EU, um, it starts to be an area to really wor be worth paying attention to. Um, next slide. And then finally, uh, the MENA region. So um, Northern Africa and the Middle East, obviously uh, major importers of, 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 of food in general, um, and in particular in, in wheat. Northern Africa is experiencing its second consecutive major drought and fourth in the last five years. Um, and so this is sort of becoming, again, a very persistent problem, not, not one that comes and goes. Um, and so 2022 was certainly a record um, at this time of the year, and 2023 now shows that it's, um, you know, uh, in more uh, severe drought conditions than we were in 2022 at this time of the year. This obviously, regions like Morocco, Egypt, which are major importers of wheat, um, Saudi Arabia is also experiencing major drought um, in wheat growing regions, um, starts to sort of contribute to the macro story of the S&D of sort of where the push and pull is going to come from. Um, so another record year of imports will be needed to meet demands of, of sort of the Middle East and North Africa. Um, next slide. So now on the demand side, um, sort of shifting over to two main themes. The first one is, is really the reopening of China, um, but also China having become a structural importer of, of, of grain, which we had not seen before. So let's just move to the next slide, please. So, you know, there have been some pretty big structural shifts on global grain demand, and that has come from, from China. So look, this is looking at the import of grain into China going back to 2017-18, where you're looking at imports of across grains of about 21.8 million tons. You know, 2018-19 um, was 14. 2020, you know, it, imports increased despite COVID by 83%. In 2021, um, those imports increased by 143% um, and up to 60, almost 65 million tons of grain imported. 2022, where essentially was a massive lockdown year, we'd not seen lockdowns of that level, grain imports only really dropped by 13%. And when you start to see what's happened at the start of this year, you know, in February, we were up 35% year on year in terms of imports. So really have made up and bounced back from um, the drop in imports experienced in 2022. So if you move to the next slide, and, and this is really this is really a big, like I said, a structural story, which becomes important to the global narrative. When you look at um, imports um, of grains of corn, rice, sorghum, wheat, and barley, um, this is again going back about you know 20 plus years um certainly recorded an, a record amount of grain uh, this past february so that that the little line that you just sort of see pop up that is essentially jan and feb um imports you know the average is the dotted line you see which used to be 1 to 2 million sort of tons um you know which obviously sort of went up to over 5 million tons. Um, again, 2022, you started to see a, a decline as, as, as sort of lockdowns happened, but that seems to have been recovered. And, and a jump in imports is being mainly dri driven by wheat and corn, uh, which have increased by 123% and 60% year on year. Now, where is this coming from and, and how is how are trade flows shifting is an important part of this conversation. So if we move to the next slide, you'll see that Brazil exports to China are surging. And this is largely due to China opening its corn purchases to include Brazil last spring. And this only recently began to take effect. So, you know, looking back several years, you'll see basically no exports of any grains from Brazil to, to China. And over the last two months, this drastic spike of 700,000 tons and 800,000 tons. And as it diversifies 
uh, food purchases, it's likely to increasingly rely on Brazil to meet its growing grain import demand. But this is this is a pretty pretty significant shift in global trade flows and and sort of um, and and what this means. Um, next slide. Uh, slide before. Yeah. Um, and then obviously this is in the context of, you know, um, protein demand and, and pork demand is a good proxy for protein demand. Um, again, pork consumption rose by more than 50% year on year as COVID restrictions were fully lifted. Such a fast growth rate isn't sustainable. And there is a bump there that is also due to things like Chinese New Year's. Um, our forecast models um, do in, indicate an increase year on year uh, for 2023 and into 2024 for, for, uh, for pork demand. Um, so this is looking at our pork demand forecast model for China in particular. Um, and you're also, you know, producer margins have been relatively volatile, which obviously drive it, but you're starting to see a, a slight recovery in producer margins um, for hogs. And so this obviously will lead to more grain and oil seed demand from China um, as they're needed for animal feed and as fundamentally sort of the way that the, 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 the animal feed market is, as, as, um, has shifted over the past few years, uh, largely because of ASF and, and sort of how the hog herd was rebuilt um, and the feed um, requirements changing as a result of that. And so that sort of leads to the final sort of topic, which, you know, obviously we only have so much time, so didn't go into vegetable oils as much, but I think still worth um, highlighting biofuels. Um, next slide, please. In particular for palm and soybean oil. So palm and soybean oil demand for industrial use continues to rise as biofuel demand increases. And this is obviously competing for vegetable oil for human consumption. Um, but it also increases competition for limited or protected arable land, especially on the palm side of the equation. And so really sort of a, a big sort of continuing and emerging theme, um, you know, vegetable oil markets haven't been as, as stressed largely due to a combination of significant demand destruction out of, um, out of China due to COVID lockdowns combined with very healthy crops from the major growing regions of Indonesia and Malaysia, um, which as you know, we go into the second half of the year are worth looking at sort of more carefully if we move, um, you know, as we're shifting and have shifted out of La Nina, but with a significant possibility of shifting into El Nino, which, which will impact um, palm production. And so um, hopefully this provides just a, a global macro view of, of where we see um, the world and sort of what the data tells us um, and happy to take any questions people might have. Thank you. Thank you very much, Sarah. Uh, this time I'd like to open it up to uh, questions and comments from the AAC members uh, on your remarks. A very informative presentation. I, I appreciate it. I've already had people ask if the slides are available. I don't know if that's, you know, that's not not my my uh, my realm here, but uh, there's certainly interest in what she provided. Um, would now I'd like to turn to AAC member questions. Uh, Mark, uh, would you like to ask a question? Yeah, thank you. <clears throat> Curious on the um, on the charts on the demand for China on the import side of the grain. Do you have an idea or a number of what the percentage of grains that U.S. is exporting to China versus uh, what they are importing from the rest of the world? I mean, you said that Brazil was certainly ramping up, but are we losing ground or gaining ground on our total? Uh, percentage of grain going into China versus their total usage? Yeah, so, I mean, you know, the, the Brazil shift just started to happen, as you can see in that chart, it's just the last two months. And frankly, there has been sort of no other producer as large as the U.S. in terms of um, exports of even beans. I mean, Brazil is obviously just as sort of competitive on the soybean side as the U.S., um, but you know, I think the diversification you're seeing is in a series of shifts of policies that are sort of worth highlighting. On wheat, for example, um, Russian wheat never used to be allowed to be imported into China. Um, and that policy was changed last year as well. Um, so until 2022, um, wheat could not come in from Russia, today it can. 
Um, so Ukraine is a much bigger supplier of wheat into China. Um, that can start to shift. And so I think from a share standpoint, you haven't seen a change in in in, in share, but um, it also is because the sheer volume of what's been imported has gone up so much that the the sort of increased, frankly, production coming out of regions such as the Black Sea region and South America have helped quell what could have been significant price increases otherwise um, from a sort of a just a global, uh, I think, standpoint. Thank you. Oh, uh, Ryan, question. And could we ask folks to to state their their affiliation? So, uh, Mark was with the American Farm Bureau Federation. So, uh, Ryan, Scott, thanks to uh, the chairman and the commissioners and and Sarah. Uh, that was a great presentation. Um, I I just want to say I'm with the American Sugar Alliance. Uh, represent Florida and Texas, Domino, uh, CNH Sugar, Imperial Sugars. Um, I just would note when we're talking to policymakers, you made a very good point. Uh, people are watching the prices. And I know there's a lot of traders on this call, people that watch this all the time. A lot of the people we talk to do not understand the payback when you're when you're selling in dollars, what's happening with the currencies back in all those other countries. I just got to say those were some fantastic charts. And I think those will be powerful when we're talking about how policies here do or do not affect what's actually happening with food getting transferred around the world. Um, and so, yeah, I, I was going to ask the same thing. If if those charts can uh, be shared, they're just really, really excellent examples of what's actually happening and why we hear prices may be coming down, but why food maybe can't actually move if people don't have the buying power in their local currencies. Yes, we'll we'll definitely make um, the slides. I think they'll be public after the the meeting, and and happy for them to be shared. Hey, Sarah, I think we probably have time for one more question. We had one come in through the chat from Ed Prosser with the Schooler Schooler Company. Um, he wanted to know, would you care to project what the veg oil usage numbers may look for may look like in twenty four, twenty five, and twenty six? Um. <laughs> You know, I don't. <laughs> let me get my magic ball out. Uh, no, <laughs> that's that's something that we certainly can project and and have, but I don't have those numbers handy, so I'd rather sort of not put pro, 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 pro projections out that I don't sort of have off the top of my head. But I, I can certainly follow up with the the projections afterwards. I think I have everybody's name, so great. Thanks. Well, I think that's probably it for the AAC members, and just to keep on schedule. I'll turn it over to the commissioner. So, Chairman Venom, starting with you, do you have any questions? Right. Sarah, thank you. That was tremendous. I quick question on the the climate issues and the drought, and obviously that spread we're seeing in in the U.S. on the north and the south. But are you, notwithstanding sort of typical weather patterns, La Nina, you pointed out, are you seeing or are you able to detect any changes in those patterns that would relieve some of that pressure on either in the southern plains or the northern plains, or these are truly sort of anomalous patterns that we're seeing that there's not really a clear sense of when things might break. So, I mean, this is the big thing that can break. This is obviously if we shift to La Nina, um, that's right, to El Nino. So if, if we do, then what you will start to see is regions that have been hit again by persistent droughts in um, North America in particular. I mean, I talked about the Southern Plains, but you also have the West Coast. Um, which we didn't touch on, and and um, South America, um, those regions should see some relief. Um, and then we'll, you'll see sort of uh, the shift will be to Malaysia, Indonesia, Australia, et cetera. And so that's where I said, like, it, it, you know, it might go sort of from a grain story to a vegetable oil story um, in terms of these shifts. And they're, they're either being so persistent or, you know, the shifts from from one to the next is is happening so fast that you know we're not having any reprieve of sort of like normalcy, uh, right? And so I think one of the one of the factors we look at is is this idea of predictability of climate, is variability of climate going up or down? So are you know are because that itself will affect 
everything from the types of inputs we need to use to the way in which we hedge markets and, and sort of hedge our, our sort of our, our, our exposures, um, variability is certainly volatility slash variability has gone up significantly over the past decade. Thanks, Sarah. I'm not sure if there are any other commissioners on the call, but certainly we'd love to take questions. Uh, if not, thank you so much, Sarah, for your presentation. And now we'll turn to the next panel. Thanks, Sarah. Thank you. So shifting gears here, it's our second panel today. We'll provide a discussion on sustainable biofuels and factors that could help reward farmers more for producing sustainable feedstocks. We will hear for in the following order, Tom Haig and Kathy uh, Bergren with the National Corn Growers Association, Michelle Mapes and Devin Mogler with Green Plains, Jared Hooker and Alexa Kombelik with the American Soybean uh, Association, and John Duff with the National Sorghum Producers. Now, Tom and uh, Kathy, kick, uh, do you all mind kicking us off? Thank you, Scott. This is uh, Tom Haig. I am president of the National Corn Growers Association, and uh, I appreciate uh, you know having the time here this morning to discuss uh, the biofuels issues with uh, with the committee here this morning, the CFTC. So uh, I'll get started here. You know, biofuels are a key market for corn growers. We um, support and demand for it takes like five million bushels a year is what uh, corn to uh, for processing into ethanol and other co-products. Biofuels and co-products production have revitalized many farmers and has also brought this back to the rural communities, creating jobs and also bringing an opportunity for younger generations to return to agriculture through increased demand and value added to our crop. Looking ahead, we continue to see a bright future for biofuels. Farmers have improved sustainability, offers new market opportunities for biofuel feedstocks that are based on federal, state, and private market incentives for lower carbon intensity, biofuels, and by extension, lower carbon, sustainable, and feedstocks. With that, I'll turn it over to Kathy to get into a little bit more of the technical things uh, with uh, biofuels with the corn growers. Kathy? Great, thanks, Tom. And, and thank you all for, for asking us to, um, you know, to be on this panel this morning and, and, and discuss these issues. Um, certainly there's a lot, a lot of new developments in this space. I think just wanted to just briefly highlight a, a couple of things that, that NCGA um, has, has been working on, on on the federal policy level and also on, on the state policy level. There's certainly a lot more going on in the private sector as well but that, that is supporting greater sustainability in, in biofuels and, and in agriculture, really by incentivizing lower carbon intensity fuels and therefore lower carbon intensity feedstocks that, that farmers produce. Uh, you know, on, on the federal level, one of the most recent developments um, is, is a new tax, a clean fuel production tax credit that was enacted through the Inflation Reduction Act. Uh, we certainly see a lot of opportunity here for, for biofuels and, and, and by extension um, for, for agriculture. Um, that, that while these tax credits are continued to be, you know, the implementation is continues through Treasury, um, we really see this as an opportunity to build on the successful renewable fuel standard. Um, you know, our our, you know, kind of our, our advocacy is really focused around ensuring that these credits, you know, account for carbon intensity, intensity reductions in feedstock productions. Uh, you know, which are really enabled by voluntary farming practices and the use of new technologies. If, if well implemented, these clean fuel credits, both for aviation and non-aviation fuels, will support continued improvements in fuel and feedstock production practices that lower GHG emissions, really allowing biofuels uh, producers to, to pass along credit benefits for, for farmers based on that feedstock production. Not only on the federal level, but also on the state level, there are, there are also policies that are you know, helping drive toward lower carbon intensity in, in agriculture and in biofuels. Um, in particular, an in, in area where, where we have been, been working on is, is with the California Low Carbon Fuel Standard. 
while there certainly are some aspects of the of the LCFS that that we might change or improve, um, this market based program has been successful in reducing the carbon intensity of biofuels. You really have biofuel producers competing to reduce their carbon intensity to access this market. Uh, NCGA has recently joined other stakeholders in advocating for the California Air Resources Board to recognize carbon intensity reductions in feedstocks produced with certain climate smart farming practices and incorporating those carbon reductions from agriculture into the fuel pathways um, that, or the fuel's carbon score that, that CARB sets. Um, I think we want to uh, encourage CARB to recognize the most verifi verifiable and impactful farming practices as a first step to incorporating additional carbon reductions in, in, that, in that feedstock. Um, if implemented, we think this will provide a stronger market, market signal to farmers to continue to improve farming practices that reduce CI and provide farmers with additional opportunities to benefit from economically. And just really briefly, you know, I, I think also kind of key to making these policies successful for corn growers, in addition to making sure we're using the most up-to-date and robust life cycle assessment for biofuels, you know, we really also want to ensure that, you know, any production practices changes for farmers are remain voluntary and that farmers' data and information are, are well protected as these markets continue to develop. Um, you know, certainly for farmers, as we know, differences in climate, soil type, moisture, and such means that there's not one size fits all for climate smart agriculture practices, but but there are certainly a lot of new opportunities, including those supported by USDA through the Climate Smart um, Commodities Grants, which we're participating in, and others. And so we want farmers continue to take advantage of these opportunities and these additional market incentives and, and incentives created by the tax credits and, and LCFS programs um, help help support those opportunities. Thank you. Thank you so much, Kathy. And just keeping on schedule here, uh, we could uh, turn it over to Michelle and Devin with Green Plains. Thank you all. Thank you, Scott. Uh, thank you, Chairman Venom and commissioners for allowing us to present today on biofuels, a, a topic that we're very passionate about here at Green Plains. Uh, just a glimpse into our company, and this is not intended to be a commercial for Green Plains, but rather to give you an idea of the innovation happening in biofuels today. At a very high level, Green Plains is a publicly traded company headquartered in Omaha. We have 11 facilities across six states um, in the United States. We produce approximately 1 billion gallons of ethanol today in our 11 facilities. We use approximately 340 million um, bushels of renewable feedstock, i.e. corn, um, to create our ethanol. But we have many other co-products and we're just beginning. Uh, we produce distillers grains, which go into cattle feed. We produce renewable corn oil that is uh, going into renewable diesel. Uh, we have an ultra high protein product that we have developed, as well as other products that I'll talk about in a bit. Um, the reason that I, I want to focus on this is that um, what we're doing at Green Plains is an innovation story that's, uh, as Chairman, um, or me, excuse me, Commissioner um, Goldsmith Romero made, um, you know, we're reducing the reliance on um, foreign oil. We're reducing um, the dependence that we have on um, other countries to uh, the security of our country. We have um, products that are reducing emissions. We are replacing petroleum products that are potentially harmful to the environment. So we're excited about the transformation of rural America that we, we believe we and the industry are contributing to. Um, just a bit of background, in 2018, 2019, the industry really faced some pretty serious challenges, um, trade and otherwise. And as a result of that, we recognized that we needed to move away from our dependence on ethanol, our co-product. And as part of that pivot, we started uh, to look at the technology and the innovation that was available to potentially take our dry mill operations and what we want to call our biorefinery of the future. And so if you go to our slide that has the transforming the biorefinery platform of the future, you'll see the journey of where we are and where we're at and where we're going. Um, we, as, as noted, we started as a simple plant, as many plants did back in 2008 or so, producing ethanol corn oil distillers grain. Uh, we bought a technology company. Uh, we are deploying much of their technology, and we are allowing the corn kernel now to produce 
so many other products. And this is just the beginning, as our CEO has talked about from time to time. Um, wet mills produce upwards to 200 products. And we are, as you can see, um, on our way to producing seven um, potentially, or excuse me, six products with carbon capture then. Um, and we are on our well on our way to uh, cracking that kernel for even more. What this does to rural America, what it does for economic development, what it does for our farmers is unimaginable because of the value that we can bring to rural America um, and to the economy with um, these products. Uh, let me touch on just a couple of the newer products that we are focused on. Ultra high protein takes the stream of distillers grains that we produce today and refines it even further into a protein product that has multiple applications in uh, various feed ingredients. Uh, Higher protein concentrations adds more value, more revenue, more return to our shareholders, but also to the farmer and the value of the corn kernel. Uh, likewise, uh, we are in the process of uh, launching our first initiative at our Shenandoah, Iowa campus, where we will produce um, dextrose, um, essentially a sugar product that will allow us to if we want to, no longer produce ethanol from the corn kernel. And that dextrose then will be um, used in the biochemical industry, potentially in food and beverage industry, um, synthetic plastics, and replacing petroleum products. Uh, so it's an exciting future, and the journey has just begun for us. And we really see that it's no longer an ethanol plant, it's a biorefinery. I think it's important to recognize where the industry is going because I want to be cognizant of the of the commissioner's comments and the sensitivity to you know uh, food prices and things like that. And so the ability to take that corn kernel and create more and more value for it is really what we are, are, are focused on. On our next slide, I wanted to give just a little bit of background for those of you not founded in some of the programs that are out there. Um, the Renewable Fuel Standard is really where much of this began back in 2005, expanded in 2007. Um, it really incentivized the production of um, biofuels by requiring certain amount be blended into to a final product, and that blend ratio was 10%. Um, and that has allowed um, the industry to really grow and thrive. And the first years of the industry as it was growing and thriving were, were incredibly successful. Uh, the one thing that's important to note for 2007 when that or 2000 when that law came into effect that it is from existing cropland no additional uh, lands can be uh, converted to cropland as a result of that otherwise you have to specifically trace where your feedstocks are coming from and so that is watched very closely uh, by EPA and therefore uh, we stay within that um, range. Um, and so it's, I think it, the renewable fuel stock, as you can see, as we've put together in our slides, what it's done, um, again, speaking to the commissioner's um, points, decreased our reliance on oil, reduced greenhouse gas emissions, um, improved air quality by replacing, um, you know, some of the dirtiest parts of gas, of, of, a gallon of gasoline. One of the things that it talked a little bit about and to Mr. Haig's comments and our, our colleagues at uh, National Corn, while one third of the U.S. corn crop does go into the production of biofuels, um, I think it's interesting that of that one third, um, approximately 25 plus percent of that corn kernel is going to be a uh, oxygenate, um, a required octane um, additive to fuel that is um, replacing NTBE, which was um, a very harmful chemical that is no longer used in the United States. So much of that corn kernel is going to a very positive use um, as a baseline oxygenate in our fuel supply. Um, on top of that, 7% of that corn kernel is going back to feed animals through distillers, grains, our protein products, and so forth. So very little is going to what I will call excess uh, fuels, renewable diesel, and so forth, when you look at the overall use of the corn kernel. Um, and then, um, as touched on by Kathy, um, in addition to the renewable fuel standard that exists um, in our uh, country, many states and other provinces outside the United States are moving to uh, low carbon fuel standards. Low carbon fuel standards, um, in many respects, are, are tailored like the renewable fuel standard. Um, they um, are incentivizing lower carbon intensity. And while I didn't touch on this on our biorefinery of the future, our products are low carbon 
and they're going lower in carbon all the time. We're very focused on making sure that our products uh, are lowering our footprint. We're doing that through the initiatives that we are engaged in with pipelines, potential other sequestration, uh, combined heat and power alternatives for um, production of electricity and power. And as a result of that, um, our products, we believe, will be some of the lowest carbon products out there competing with the products that exist today that may not be as healthy for our economy. I'm going to turn it over to my colleague, Devin Mogler, who's going to talk a bit about why um, these uh, programs that are coming into being are important to us and how they impact biofuels and particularly how they impact the uh, farmer and um, how, how that value gets traced through the um, initiative. Devin, take it away. Thanks, Michelle. And thank you, Chairman Benham and commissioners. If you could go forward uh, two slides, please. I want to touch some more on what Kathy with the corn growers talked about with the, uh, the new uh, 45Z clean fuel production credit. So the, this was created as part of the Inflation Reduction Act. Um, it is designed to be a technology neutral fuel tax credit for incentivizing the reduction in carbon intensity. As Michelle mentioned, and Kathy did as well, the low carbon fuel standard in California, and now this on top of it, has created a veritable arms race in the industry to reduce carbon intensity. And not only at our biofuel refineries, where we're focused on carbon capture and sequestration, wind and solar and cogeneration, as Michelle mentioned, but also the on farm practices. 25 CI points. Um, out of uh, the roughly 55 to 60 at your average ethanol plant today is from on-farm practices. And this is under the, the Argonne Greed model from the Department of Energy. So there's a ton of opportunity there on-farm for this to be that carrot rather than a heavy-handed regulation that can incentivize voluntary uh, reductions in, in uh, carbon intensity on-farm, whether it's cover crops, uh, reduced application of nitrogen, split application, precision ag, et cetera. So we believe there's a big opportunity here. Of course, uh, the devil's always in the details when it comes to regulatory rulemaking. So we need Treasury to allow for that sort of uh, specificity um, and that granularity uh, to allow uh, climate smart ag practices to contribute uh, here. We believe congressional intent was to spur investment and in decarbonization across all facets of the energy landscape. And they specifically included $20 billion, excuse me, for working lands conservation programs so we believe that, that this um, uh, ties in directly there as well. Um, and if you could go to the next slide, uh, just some of the reasons, and, and the corn growers and sorghum and soybean guys can probably speak um, more accurately to this, but from my experience as a farm kid and working in ag my whole life, you know, the, the, generally the, the barriers to getting farmers to adopt practices have been lack of monetary incentives, opposition to mandatory requirements, trepidation about data sharing, uh, and, and not receiving credit for past practices that they were already doing. And I believe that the 45Z clean fuel production credit really helps address all of those and possibly even the data concerns, but certainly uh, three of the four. Um, you know, if it, one bushel of corn is producing three gallons of ethanol today, and as we mentioned, 25 CI points are attributed to on-farm practices, that's about $1.50 per bushel in the value chain just from on-farm production practices if we're turning that corn uh, into a gallon of ethanol. So on a per acre basis, looking at average yields of about 108, 180 bushel per uh, acre, that's $270 per acre sitting out there. So it's uh, um, a step change from the numbers that have been talked about in the past of you know 10 or 20 bucks an acre for cover crops and other practices. I think there's real value here and real opportunity to transform the way we do agriculture. Thank you. Jared and Alexa. Uh, good morning, uh, Chairman Benham, fellow commissioners. Uh, the American Soybean Association uh, represents over 500,000 soybean farmers in, in this 26 states and some multi-state um, organizations. Uh, the, profession, the professional staffer uh, that will make the remarks for my, my group, the American Soybean Association, is Alexa Kondelik, uh, who is based in Washington. Alexa, please. Yeah. And, and thanks, Chair, Chairman Benham and, and Scott and uh, commissioners for this. Um, we heard a lot already, I think, about, about ethanol, and so just a little 
uh, primer on biomass-based diesel, soybean oil uh, provides about 50% of uh, the feedstock for biomass-based diesel, which encompasses biodiesel, renewable diesel, um, and now we're seeing you know, some development in the sustainable aviation fuel space. Um, but we've seen over the past few years a real, a real boom in, in biomass-based diesel and specifically renewable diesel production. Um, as of October 2022, um, there was a capacity of about 4.2 billion gallons in, in the um, biomass-based diesel space. And looking at renewable diesel specifically, expansion of just that fuel um, should be reaching about 5.2 billion gallons by 2025. And a lot of that is spurred by what, um, what we're seeing on the West Coast. You've heard a little bit already about low carbon fuel standard programs, um, California truly driving uh, force behind all of that. Um, with the renewable fuel standard, the development of, of tax credits um, that are benefiting uh, our fuels, I think we're seeing continued growth and continued demand, especially as um, you know, sectors are trying to lower their carbon intensity. Biomass-based diesel serves as a a really unique drop in fuel that can replace traditional diesel in uh, older equipment and in areas that are hard to elect electrify, like uh, heavy duty hauling, marine transport, um, rail, and more. And so, uh, we as a as an association, um, you know, continue to to look at ways in which we can lower carbon intensity on the farm in order to improve those CI scores. I think as as we have seen in, in the food space already, there is there is growing demand to have uh, more sustainable food, more sustainable fuel, and, and knowing that that uh, that on farm uh, origination point is is doing everything that they can to to uh, improve environmental practices um, in the fuel sector. I think we're seeing a lot of uh, a lot of traditional petroleum com companies who are now interested in uh, diversifying their portfolio and moving towards uh, more renewable diesel and, and biodiesel uh, uh, services. And I think, um, you know, one thing we've been hearing from these companies is that they would like to find ways in order to, uh, you know, improve uh, the CI scores that they're seeing through, you know, locally growing beans that are, that are using certain practices in which they could maybe lower those scores even more. Um, we've had many discussions about this, uh, you know, at the farm level, you know, nationally among all of our uh, members. And I think some of the concerns that we have and you've already heard is about farmer data um, and about some of the logistical challenges in terms of traceability. Um, beans are, I think, a little different than, than corn going to ethanol in which, um, you know, the beans are normally produced and then they have to go to a crushing facility in which they're separated into oil and meal. And then from there, that oil is going to a refinery to be turned into renewable diesel. It creates a, a larger web of uh, logistical challenges in terms of tracing the carbon intensity from the farm all the way to the end product. And I think, um, you know, as farmers are trying to capitalize on the investments that they're making on their farm, wanting to ensure that they are... Uh, that they are receiving all of the benefits that they can, uh, both from these voluntary incentive programs at, at the USDA, and now uh, is seeing uh, private companies also trying to uh, capture some of those benefits from the carbon that they are sequestering. Uh, it's become a bit of a, a, a I think, confusing puzzle uh, of how you can, how you can quantify, uh, how you can trace uh, where, where these carbon uh, credits or, or, or carbon scores are, are moving. And I think, uh, you know, from our perspective, as we continue to look towards new uh, programs, uh, the, the patchwork of LCFS programs that are, that are seemingly, uh, you know, gaining popularity across the country, we are, um, you know, really interested to see how this ends up playing out. And I think this discussion, and, and it sounds like there were previous discussions on how this would work at you know, a local level, a regional level, in terms of uh, in terms of tracing that that uh, carbon benefit, how that would work in in a larger scale. And so, um, 
you know, from our perspective, and I think across commodities, this is a discussion that we are continuing to have, and I think have sometimes wound up with more questions than answers uh, in how this all plays together among federal level, state level, and private investment. And there are a number of companies already working uh, with farmers to capture those benefits of uh, their ecosystem services markets that they're working in. But uh, to do that on a national level, and when you include every piece of the value chain, I think uh, we are we are still struggling to find uh, the silver bullet there, but I'm really glad that this discussion is happening today. And I think uh, you know what we heard from from the ethanol and and corn folks, and and what you're hearing from us now is that uh, you know there is a, a demand and a and a hunger to do better and to improve our uh, improve our carbon intensity scores. Um, but to get there uh, through the incentive process is uh, is continuing to be a bit of a challenge. Thanks. Thanks, Alexa. John, are you uh, are you ready to go? I am. Uh, well, thanks to uh, the the committee and Scott for for putting this together. I, I'm I'm glad I'm going last. Uh, my my comments were. Um, somewhat of a, a, a wrap up of all of these topics anyway. So I, I think um, what, what I'm going to say here will serve to briefly summarize it, punctuate it, and, uh, and, and kick off uh, a little bit of discussion, hopefully. <clears throat> I'm John Duff with National Sorghum Producers. Uh, I'm actually a consultant to National Sorghum Producers. Uh, I own a consulting company called Cerro Ag Strategies, uh, but I mainly work for National Sorghum Producers and mainly in the area of uh, uh, sustainability. National Sorghum Producers, of course, was one of 141 uh, uh, recipients of uh, grants under the USDA's Partnerships for Climate Smart Commodities grant program. Um, National Sorghum Producers received a $65 million award under that. I'll talk a little more about that and why it's important to this discussion in a second. Um, first, a little bit about sorghum. Sorghum, of course, is a cousin to corn that's grown on about 100 million acres worldwide, about 7 million in the United States. Uh, and one third of those uh, bushels of sorghum produced in the United States go to fuel ethanol production, uh, almost entirely in Texas uh, and Kansas. And of that, a large amount uh, goes to California to be sold under the uh, low carbon fuel standard. The low carbon fuel standard, of course, has rigorous guidelines for carbon intensity, uh, as you heard from uh, others earlier uh, on the panel. Uh, but it's worth noting that the LCFS, as important as it is, is one of many, many, many such uh, fuel standards. There are actually 66 countries globally that have some sort of fuel standard. Now, some of those are in sub-Saharan Africa, and so uh, it's more like a um, it's more like a goal or a target rather than having really rigorous um, reporting requirements. But still, uh, there is a standard there, and there's a goal and there's a target to reduce the emissions of fuels. There are dozens, though, of countries that have very, very rigorous um, standards for their fuel standards. Uh, and we also have uh, other states beyond just California and the United States. And of course, under the Inflation Reduction Act, uh, Treasury itself will serve uh, in a way uh, as a low carbon fuel standard going forward. And so there is a lot of opportunity uh, for on farm uh, tracking of practices uh, as we go forward, just looking at the fuel markets alone. Uh, to meet the goals, the very ambitious goals that have been set by California and others uh, for emissions reductions under their programs, we have to uh, uh, look at on-farm practices. That is, uh, of course, about 25% uh, to a third of the footprint of fuels. Uh, and so it's very, very low-hanging fruit uh, when you look at ways to actually reduce uh, the life cycle emissions uh, of fuels. It's, it's difficult to do that, of course. Uh, there are myriad challenges uh, with that. You have uh, varying uh, degrees of sophistication, complexity, uh, uh, and even quality of data on the farm. You have a, a, a real spectrum. There are still some farmers that have everything in a shoebox uh, that they give to their account at the end of the year. Uh, and then you have extremely sophisticated growers 
who are capturing uh, all of these data on the fly from the, the tractor itself. And that's all going in a central repository. It's tracked against the farm number. It's tracked against uh, actual loads of grain that have been taken to the elevator. It's, it's extremely sophisticated. Uh, and they're not going to have a problem at all complying with any kind of reporting requirements on the farm. Uh, but again, you'll have those that, that don't, and then you have everyone in between there. So it is definitely a challenging uh, uh, situation uh, to navigate as we look at how you capture what's going on on the farm and transmit it through the supply chain. Um, that is what the crux of the National Soil Producers Climate Smart Grant uh, uh, was designed to do. Uh, it was designed after five years uh, to have a platform in place that allows us to capture data on the farm and pass it through the supply chain, ultimately to the final end user of that data, whether it's a food company, whether it's a, a, a low carbon fuel standard or an ecosystem services market, otherwise that wants to capture the value of those on-farm practices from a environmental services and environmental benefit to society perspective. Uh, we believe the platforms are in place today. Uh, I don't think we would have been awarded a $65 million grant if we didn't have a team ready to actually make this happen. Uh, there are probably a dozen different platforms for capturing that value on the farm. Uh, there are probably a dozen different intermediaries that stand between the uh, ethanol plant and the ultimate fuel standard. Uh, and it's just a matter of making sure all those parties are talking to each other and are able to handle the data and pass the data through uh, in a way that will give uh, California low carbon fuel standard, um, the renewable energy directive in, uh, in the EU, uh, or even the Department of Treasury, the uh, satisfaction of knowing that those practices are what those farmers are saying, and those emissions reductions are actually taking place. Like I said, I think it's all in place today. It's just a matter of getting them at the table and coordinating all that. And hopefully our grant over the next five years uh, will uh, generate that platform and that framework that anyone in the industry, whether it's a sorghum farmer, whether it's a corn farmer, whether it's a soybean farmer, will be able to use to monetize the value of those practices and the good work that they're already doing on the farm. Uh, with that, I will yield. Scott? Yeah, thanks so much, uh, John, and for all, all the other panelists. Really appreciate these thoughtful insights. Now I'd like to turn it over to the AAC members for questions. And Mark with the American Farm Bureau Federation, you, you're up first because you raised in, uh, earlier, and then we'll turn to you, Tommy. I, I appreciate that. I appreciate all the presenters. Uh, just a really an excellent job. So as American Farm Bureau uh, sitting on that board, I uh, in Nebraska farm three sides of a Green Plains ethanol plant, and I I probably don't go more than a couple of days without talking about carbon intensity scores and the American farmer and how we're going to comply actually with these standards. I feel like we really have a wall coming in potentially 27, 28 arena where we have a significant amount of players that are saying that they need their scores at a particular place without significant plans on how to do that. Um, I, I was interested, uh, Devin, really in your comments of potentially $1.50 a bushel for on-farm on practices at $270 an acre. Our concern with our producers has been especially how do we work with the ethanol plants to actually realize that? And to John's point, and I appreciate that they are working on a platform, but boy, from our perspective, there just is not... A, a system out there that's rolling this up and is going to make it available to farmers to really capture all these things that are out there. There's a tremendous amount of uh, initiatives out there, but to get that to a point where the producer actually has a, a certified CI score that they redu reduce their emissions on the farm, that they get to be a part of that value chain as it goes into the ethanol plant. We haul all of our Grain nearly 100% to Green Plains here, but to capture that is difficult. And then just one question I was curious in the Green Plains, for the carbon pipeline, how, how confident are you that the carbon pipelines are gonna be a, become a reality? Yeah, thanks for that question, Mark, and, and thanks for uh, your, your business. Um, we, we appreciate it, don't take it for granted. 
Uh, maybe let me start with the carbon pipelines. You know, there's there's a lot of uh, challenges there uh, between getting state approvals as well as county level approvals and, and signing up voluntary easements from farmers. But from what I've seen, uh, they've made a tremendous amount of pro uh, progress with getting voluntary easements and none of it has been blocked at the state level uh, that I've seen. So I, I think there's a better than 50-50 chance those projects move forward, uh, one or multiple of them. And, and some of those uh, could be operating as soon as 2025 when the clean fuel production credit goes into place. To your other question, it, there's certainly a, a lot of uh, you know, concerns about how we, we track all that data from the farm and how we're able to capture that value and be able to share it through the value chain between the farmer and the biofuel producer. Um, there's a number of companies that are trying to, to crack that. And I don't believe anyone has found the silver bullet yet, but I think there's certainly a number of technologies out there that, that have a promising path forward. Uh, we're talking to a number of those folks. Uh, we've looked at internal systems as well. Um, and, and hopefully we can you know, have something in place uh, by the time that credit comes into place. But I want to emphasize again what, I'm, the, what Kathy mentioned from the corn growers and I did as well. There's a significant gating item in the, the Treasury regulations. They're writing the regs today. Uh, unclear when they'll come out, hopefully later this year. But it's up to them to specify whether or not on-farm practice, practices can qualify for carbon reduction. We believe they should. Uh, everyone else who's spoken today believes they should. Um, I think it was the intent of Congress to have that happen. So I think anything you and the Farm Bureau can do to continue to reach out to Treasury on the, during the rulemaking process uh, would be helpful. So thank you again, Mark. Call me uh, with the Commodity Markets Council. Do you have any uh, question? Uh, yes, I do have one for the panelists. It, it's really concerning the the 45Z tax credits that are outlined in the IRA. Um, and I guess the concern I have is how these tax credits are considered in, when you're um, in the calculation of a global minimum tax. So to me, it just seems that this could prevent stakeholders from achieving, achieving the intent of the statute. Just wondering if anybody has any um, comments on that, or if there's a coalition that's working to, to address this potential impediment. Any takers? I know it's complex, but it, um, I, th I think there is something there. Just curious if there's any, if there is a coalition or if this has been discussed in any forum. If there is, Tommy, I'm not aware of it, can certainly follow up on that and get back to you. That'd be great. We do have some members of CMC that have addressed this, so thank you. Any other questions from the AAC members? Okay, I have a question to the panelists. Uh, what is the growth path for sustainable aviation fuel? I'm happy to address that. Um, Green Plains recently signed uh, an agreement uh, with United Airlines and Tallgrass to uh, launch air sustainable aviation fuel. Uh, one of the key gating items is technology. Um, as you know, we are an ag tech company, that's critically important to us. Uh, we are in the process um, of finalizing our license with uh, PNNL and one of the national labs to you to build out that technology um, when that technology is uh, fully um, employed at a commercial scale uh, we believe that uh, the pathway is there subject to uh, certain regulatory requirements that i'll have Devin touch on uh, again some rulemaking that needs to happen that recognizes uh, the applicable model that would be favorable um, for alcohol to jet to uh, fall within those credits Devin, do you want to cover that Sure thing. So as I mentioned earlier, the 45Z uh, clean fuel production credit specifies the DOE's argon greet model. That gives uh, biofuel production, um, particularly ethanol credit for carbon capture and doesn't have nearly as punitive of uh, land use change and uh, farming practices uh, penalty that some of the other models do. For whatever reason, Congress uh, chose to specify a separate model, uh, the International Civil Aviation Organization's uh, Corsia model, which does not give us credit for carbon capture and has a punitive uh, land use change uh, score. So if they stick with that, uh, if Treasury sticks with that during the rulemaking, it would basically preclude 
alcohol to jet, sustainable aviation fuel from corn ethanol produced in the U.S. And the problem there is, as Alexa alluded to with, with soybeans, you know, we've got all this renewable diesel production capacity coming online. Some of that you can turn the dial and, and crack off a little more uh, S, SAF as, instead of renewable diesel. But at some point, there's going to be a limited amount of uh, veg oil feedstocks to meet the needs for not only SAF and RD. I believe we will have enough um, with all the new crushing capacity coming online, with all the new renewable corn oil we're spinning off at our ethanol plants. I don't believe we're going to have a, a challenge in feedstocks, but the aviation sector is so large. It's 36 billion gallons just in the U.S. And if you want to get there uh, and replace all of that, you need to use alcohol to jet. Absolutely. I, I would just echo what Devin said. Um, it's difficult to obviously decarbonize um, that type of fuel other than through ethanol, we believe. Um, the second thing I would add is that states are also um, offering initiatives, much like the low carbon fuel standard. We've now seen Illinois offer credits specifically to sustainable aviation fuel um, with other bills like that being introduced. Kathy, did you want to chime in as well? No, I was just sorry, Scott. Yeah, no, I was just going to say we we certainly agree with that, um, and and agree with where where Devin was at, um, on particularly on on the policy side. It's you know it's very important that, um, you know, on this guidance from Treasury on on the tax credits and ensuring that there is a robust domestic life cycle analysis model. Uh, we prefer the the Department of Energy's uh, GREEP model. We think that that is the best the best model out there. You know, certainly for um for for the you know commitments and goals from, from the administration on sustainable aviation fuel to be able to achieve those targets. I think we're going, we, you know, believe we're going to need fuels um, from a wide variety of feedstocks, especially agriculture feedstocks. And, you know, it would be, you know, to, to have a, you know, incentive system that would exclude those fuels is, is going to prevent um, re reaching those goals. So that has certainly has been a, a very key piece, um, you know, on these ongoing treasury rulemakings to, to ensure that these fuels are not disqualified um, really before the production has, has a chance to, to take off with these new technologies. Great. Thanks. Swati, uh, I don't know. I, I have another question, but I also want to respect the, uh, the chairman. <laughs> Scott, I, I'm going to just jump in. I do want to, no question per se, but I do want to thank all the, the speakers, um, including Tom and Jared for popping in from, from corn growers and soybeans as well. Um, just point out some of the things that, you know, these are real opportunities for producers and landowners. Devin mentioned this, and I think, um, I think this committee can, should continue to think about what we could do at the commission. Obviously, we're seeing a lot of new products being listed uh, on our exchanges that you know end up becoming both a price discovery and risk management tool. But um, there are a lot of components to what was discussed um, at a lot of different agencies within the federal government. Obviously, USDA, EPA, and, and as we just heard, Treasury with with respect to the rulemaking and how things are um, finalized, but. Certainly, we'll we'll do our part. I'll do my part, but I think this is a real opportunity, um, as was pointed out, for landowners, and we should continue having this discussion, uh, not only on on products and and how biofuels will play a role in both agriculture, but the energy transition, uh, but this discussion around carbon intensity and and getting um, accurate scoring metrics um, applied. And I know there's a lot of efforts from the private sector, but um, this is an, an area where clearly there's a public-private um, demand and need so that we can have uh, a level playing field and a unified standard so that growers know what rules they're playing by and then they can have those incentives um, to, to participate in these opportunities because both from a sustainability standpoint, but obviously from a, um, a revenue standpoint, I think this is a great opportunity for the farm, um, <clears throat> farm community. Thanks. Great. Thank you, Chairman Swati, turning uh, to you. Thank you, Scott. So at this time, the AAC will take a 15 minute break. So if all the members and guest panelists and commissioners could please make sure your Zoom is on mute and turn off your video during the break, we will resume at 11 a.m. Eastern. Thank you. We are just going to resume the meeting 
Um, so at this time, I would like to call the AAC meeting back to order and I'll turn the agenda back over to Scott. Thank you. Great, thanks so, so much, Swati. And, and for our third presentation today, we will hear from Chairman Daniel Maffei of the Federal Maritime Commission for discussion on maritime issues impacting the agricultural economy. Chairman Maffei, uh, feel free to go ahead now. Thanks so much. Yeah, sure. Uh, yes, I thank you very much. First of all, I apologize for coming in by phone. I uh, have been sitting in my office uh, for, for quite a while, and uh, I have my my aides and uh, the aides over at the um, CFTC busily trying to get me connected uh, by Zoom, and for some reason it's not working. So I do apologize, but um, certainly uh, I think some of you already know what I look like. It's it's not that big a deal probably that I can't come in uh, video. But uh, let me do uh, just say that anything that I say, you know, does reflect my own views and not the official position of the Federal Maritime Commission um, or of the Biden administration or my wife or my eight-year-old child. Uh, I want to thank uh, everyone for inviting me um, and uh, um, uh, uh, particularly uh, uh, Chairman Benham. Um, I do appreciate the opportunity to discuss all the supply chain challenges that have affected agricultural producers. Uh, and their ability to get their products to overseas markets. Now, I thought the most helpful thing I could do is just sort of give an overview of, of who we are at the Federal Maritime Commission, um, which I will call FMC, um, and what we regulate. Um, we are actually like the CFTC in a couple of ways. We're an independent commission. Um, we have five independent commissioners, each of whom is appointed by the sitting president for a specific term that can and often does cross into the next administration. So we are ind independently appointed we're not part of a cabinet department. Um, and the president can't appoint more than three members of his own party. So we are bipartisan currently. We're three Democratic appointees and two Republican appointees. Uh, and as chairman, I am the CEO, but my vote counts the same as each other member. Um, as a practical matter, though, even though we, we do come from political parties, we, we do most things by consensus. Um, and frankly, even when we don't do something by consensus, usually we have an honest disagreement, and it's not usually due to a political party. So I am glad to say that that you know, Washington is pretty partisan lately, but uh, we, you know, we at our little commission try to uh, avoid that. Uh, we oversee ocean transportation service between the U.S. and foreign ports um, provided by companies that operate ocean cargo carrying ships that offer their services to the general public. We call these vessel operating common carriers or VOCCs or simply ocean carriers. Um, uh, that, that, by the way, we call them carriers as opposed to shippers. Shippers are all of you. Our shippers are, are anybody who is sending something or receiving something through international transportation. So sometimes my former colleagues on Capitol Hill get that mixed up. They'll say, oh, the shippers did this and do that. And what they really mean is the ocean carriers uh, you know, did something that, that, that they may not like. Um, the Shipping Act establishes the requirements for all the carrier, all those ocean carriers, as well as U.S. marine terminal operators that, that serve those carriers and companies that act as intermediaries that provide services such as booking ocean transportation and arranging for related logistics. Um, now, we at the FMC, we regulate uh, cargo transported mostly by container, um, but we also do uh, those roll-on, roll-off vessels. So, like if you're uh, importing a, a tractor or, or you know, companies that export, um, you know, equipment or cars, for instance, will go that way. Um, because of the way the space is managed on bulk and break bulk specialty cargo tanker vessels, all of those kind of categories, we rarely get involved with those. Uh, the regulations concerning them, it's, it's more of a closed. Uh, system. It's not what well, it's not the, the uh, available to the, the public like uh, uh, cargo in a container is. Um, we also do have a few regulatory responsibilities concerning the cruise industry uh, uh, if they're international, if it's, a, if it's a route between U.S. and a foreign destination. Um, we monitor competition among vessel operators and marine terminal operators when they enter into certain kinds of agreements, which under law allow them to legally collaborate in certain ways, as long as the reduction in competition does not unreasonably raise prices or lower the service, and that's what we uh, we take a very close look at to make sure. Um, I do want to note that the international ocean shipping was thoroughly deregulated in the 1980s, 
and is subject to far less regulation than domestic shipping or trucking, rail, air cargo, or almost any other kind of transportation you're used to are more are, are more regulated. Ocean transportation seems to work in a in a predominantly deregulated environment, and that's why a very small agency of only about 150 professionals and support staff can oversee this 1.3 trillion dollars in commerce every year. However, um, because of our small size, it's one of the reasons why uh, we're one of the few agencies of government that's actually grown in the recent couple of years with targeted budget increases supported widely by both Republicans and Democrats. Now, one of the key areas that we have souped up recently is enforcement. Uh, Shipping Act restrictions and the rules that the FMC promulgates to interpret these, uh, the Shipping Act are all enforced through our uh, Bureau of Investigations, Enforcement, and Compliance, which is staffed by, you know, attorneys mostly. They act as investigators and sometimes prosecutors and bring enforcement actions against uh, suspected violators. Um, we do have, by the way, investigators assigned to a lot of areas in the country, major coastal uh, port areas such as Houston, L.A., Long Beach, and Seattle. And we soon will be locating a few investigators in the interior in the country, in part, by the way, to be closer to the ag shippers and inland transportation hubs such as Chicago and Memphis. Um, Now, a shipper or any person harmed by the Shipping Act violation can also file a private complaint and seek uh, damages for their loss. Um, We have a couple of links on our website uh, that are like webinars that explain various enforcement actions that, you know, private entities uh, can take. We also have a consumer affairs office that provides advice and dispute resolution um, and sometimes mediation services to shippers. Uh, That office is staffed by attorney and some industry experts, including uh, specifically an expert in export issues most likely to affect agricultural shippers. We designated that um, when I became chairman because it was so important to have a, a go-to place uh, uh, for exporters. Um, now, of course, for the past few years, the pandemic and the boom in demand for imported goods has spurred unprecedented problems with port congestion and spiraling freight costs. And that's obviously where, we, where we've been focused. Um, uh, among other pressures and challenges, shippers were being asked to pay escalating fees called detention and demerge charges for cargo that wasn't picked up on time or empty containers that were not returned within a designated time frame. And sometimes um, these fees were really uh, unreasonable because you couldn't return the cargo. There was something preventing you. For instance, the, 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 the actual terminal refused to take back the box if it was empty or uh, it was under so many other boxes that they refused to give it to to a shipper who was receiving it. Um, uh, There were congestion, chassis shortages, other issues. Shippers often face these charges despite, um, you know, the fact that they were doing the very best they could and the, the the situation was out of their control. So, um, and 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 in the height of the pandemic, the sheer volume of imports were simply crowding out exports. And there were even reports of ocean carriers simply ignoring exporters' needs in order to get empty containers back to Asia to fill with additional imports for U.S. consumers because they were making so much more on the imports than they could on the exports. Um, even if the exports seemed like they were costing more money, the carriers were still making a lot more on the on the imports. Now, fortunately, the worst of these supply chain problems that was experienced at the height of the pandemic have abated. Um, we're no longer seeing that port congestion, those lines of ships you all saw in the news, uh, the skyrocketing fees that were common uh, are, are, have, have abated. Um, but I do think it's very important to know that just because of all this has been reduced doesn't mean that the underlying problems and difficulties have all been solved. We're working on solving a lot of those um, partly for now and partly for the next crisis when it occurs, because um, one thing that we've all learned is, is supply and demand cannot be uh, predicted when it comes to ocean freight. So we need to be ready. Um, now, of course, a lot of the, the the reason why things have gotten better was due to the changing market forces. But I do believe that the commission has done really important work in holding carriers accountable for the unfair and unreasonable practices that, that they might have been doing it at the, the height of the pandemic. Our caseload has roughly tripled compared to just a couple of years ago. And uh, the record amounts of fees to ocean carriers, the record amounts of fees have been canceled or refunded. Um, and this trend of refunding and canceling fees has uh, continued long after the congestion started declining. So it's not just due to the fact that congestion meant there were more fees and therefore more, more fees were funded. They're, they're, the carriers are, I think, um, uh, beginning to to understand that that a lot that you know excessive fees that that you know can't be uh, helped by the shipper are not going to be tolerated. We also have a new fast track charge complaint process, and that alone has been responsible for about a million dollars in uh, waived fees. Now, as a former congressman, 
it gives me a lot of pain to say it, but I have to give a lot of the credit to Congress. Uh, because last year, uh, they passed uh, on a broad bipartisan basis the Ocean Shipping Reform Act of 2022. And that sent a message that the ocean carriers abusing detention demerge system or unreasonably refusing exports will no longer be tolerated. Um, when the president signed that into law in uh, June of last year, it was the first major change to the international ocean freight shipping laws in nearly a quarter of a century. Obviously, a lot has changed in shipping since then. So it, in my view, it was well needed. And it did give the FMC uh, additional funding, as I mentioned earlier, and, and additional authorities. Now, and a large part of the reason why it happened was due to America's agricultural groups and their constructive involvement with us at the FMC and with the Congress. So um, although the supply chain conditions have greatly improved, we know there are going to be future challenges and, and anything in global events uh, could change that um, uh, uh, at one of the big shipping conferences, um, ocean shipping conferences out in L.A., General Petraeus uh, was actually the guest, and uh, he was saying that, you know, the area of the era of benign shipping is over. And one of the things he was talking about was just how, um, how challenging it's going to be in the future uh, to predict um, the events that might uh, create uh, issues with our supply chain, and, and we need to be ready. Um, now, uh, everything I've been discussing involves international ocean shipping, but there are a lot of other kinds of things that involve shipping, and it can be confusing. I mean, what about domestic shipping, for instance, like uh, if you're shipping, uh, you know, uh, produce to Hawaii or to Puerto Rico? That actually is not regulated by us. That's regulated by um, the Department of Transportation's um, um, Maritime Administration, um, as is um, aid to foreign countries like USAID aid. Um, that's foreign countries. A lot of stuff like food safety is regulated at the ports by FDA. Um, there's a number of other things. Obviously, ship safety, if you're dealing with hazardous cargo, is going to be uh, the U.S. Coast Guard. Um, uh, what about environmental issues? Well, that's usually the EPA or the Coast Guard. Um, I know there's been a lot of talk about Mississippi and the record low uh, water levels in Mississippi and the need for dredging and stuff. Of course, dredging is the uh, core of engineers. Um, but we at the FMC, although we're concerned with this issue because it does affect international ocean shipping, if you can't uh, navigate the Mississippi, then there's going to be a, an effect on international ocean shipping. And, and that's very, very important. And so we monitor it. We, we, we try to figure out what's going on. We're interested, but we don't have any uh, power as an agency to change any of those things. Um, other kinds of things, uh, um, you know, that, that other kinds of uh, Things that might be regulated, uh, uh, like customs and and border patrol and things like that, have to do with like a drug interdiction and that sort of thing. So there, there are so many different agencies that affect various kinds of ocean shipping, uh, both domestic and foreign and all that. That if you if you truly understand exactly where you're, you know, what agency does what, then um, then I, I think maybe you're not trying hard enough because because it can, it is genuinely very very confusing. Now the one thing I will say that the FMC does do is it, if you call our, uh, our our consumer affairs division and the numbers right on our website, and you say, "Look, I don't think you guys handle this, but I'm having trouble with this," they'll tell you where to go. Right? If they if they don't know, they'll find out. And you know, so so we do try to make sure, particularly that you know our exporters and importers um, are helped, even if we're not the ones helping them. We try to point them. Uh, to the right direction. You know, I, 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 I did, I was a congressman for a couple of terms. And one of the things that I was a really positive experience for me was the constituent service. And I've tried to take that. And I think my fellow commissioners here um, at the FMC agree. And, and frankly, I, I think Chair, Chairman Benham is of the same mindset that, you know, we still have constituents. They're not, it's, I, I, mine aren't confined to a district anymore, but they are the people who export, the people who import important products. And, um, you know, my district was, uh, large, you know, largely agricultural. It had a city in it, but the city was only 20% of the population. And I do believe that American farmers, you know, can feed the world, but um, but we need to make sure that they get their products uh, and they have the ability to to get their products to the people who need them. And so, in that, I do think we all have different roles to play, but we all have that uh, that same goal um, to try to help. And uh, that that's all I have to say. But I'm happy to take any questions or engage in any discussion. Still, still no video. Buddy, Which uh, unfortunately, I see you're, yeah. Sorry, sorry, Chairman Faye. Uh, we had a, uh, somebody raise their hand from the, the panels. Uh, 
members. Great. Buddy, do you want to go? Right. Uh, thank you, Scott, and thank you, Chairman Benham and, and Chairman Buffet. It's it's encouraging to see these two agencies uh, sharing information and working together. So I appreciate appreciate that occurring today. Uh, Chairman Maffei, uh, first of all, thank you for the good work on the implementation I, of OSRA. Um, I can't see you, but is this buddy? I assume it is. <laughs> <laughs> it is. It is. Okay, um, good, good. Uh, um, I got two issues I, I want to raise and, and get your thoughts on that affect both our members and many of the people on this call who are containerized shippers of ag products, um, jurisdiction and cargo receiving. We we advocate for, and I've told you this before, we think the Federal Maritime Commission should have clear and expanded jurisdiction for a move across the entirety of a maritime bill of lading. So if we start with goods in the interior, by truck, by rail, then by vessel, we'd like to see that entirety of that maritime BL be under your jurisdiction. Uh, there's, there's tremendous uncertainty around that now. The second thing is cargo receiving. As we have expressed before, uh, when you have multiple carriers sharing space on a vessel, you've got three or four different different timelines and, and, and regimes of, of, of rules around when containers are taken and removed. In many cases, they conflict with the terminal operator. And then what they are is inconsistent and, in our opinion, unreasonable as far as the amount of lead time they give. It takes us weeks in the interior to get warehouse appointments. We get hours notice when ERDs change uh, from ocean carriers. So my question around all that to you is, do you feel like OSRA has given you the authority you need to address those issues? Or is this something that we should be advocating for in subsequent legislation? I know that's being contemplated on the Hill now. Thank you for taking the Yeah, point. yeah. Well, yeah, absolutely. And, and uh, you know, and and uh, I enjoyed watching your testimony. I thought you did a great job. I actually, I thought all all four panelists did a great job um, at that hearing. Even if I disagreed with with a few of what people were saying, they they certainly made good arguments, and, and everything was very substantive. It's, it's sort of what congressional subcommittee hearings are supposed to be back in the old days when we actually talked about policy and and didn't just grandstand. Um, but anyway, uh, to answer this, I think the second part of your question is is a bit harder to answer the specific question. But do we have the authority? Um, I, I think we probably do, but it depends on kind of what those solutions are. And because of the complexity of the problem, you know, as you mentioned, various uh, carriers sometimes sharing space on the same ship, but also a number of other things, different uh, terminals have different policies. Uh, the clock for when a container arrives uh, and when the quote unquote free time starts is different and all those sort of things. All that has to be unwound. It, the main thing is transparency, right? We, your shippers deserve to know when they're supposed to be there, when they're not. And if something comes up that's unavoidable, well, that's fine, but that should be communicated too openly, right? You know, if the ship has to be delayed because of the storm out at sea, well, that's not anyone's fault, right? But it still needs to be communicated. So we're doing a lot of work on that. Um, Carl Benzel, um in his own office, so this is not a product of the commission, uh, per se, but 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 I asked him to to volunteer, and he did. <laughs> once I asked him uh, to to look at a lot of the data issues. Um, other agencies are looking at this too, the DOT and the White House even. But but we want to make sure we have a seat at that table because of the you know particular folks that that you know we we uh, we uh, service particularly you know ag exporters being a, a main one of those. Um, as you know, uh, Commissioner Dye is. Uh, you know, quickly becoming uh, the, the one of the foremost experts in the nation on ERDs and and how to uh, get a better handle on that. Um, so, uh, do we have enough authority? I just don't. I don't know yet um, because I don't know what the solutions are, um, and, and and that's part of the issue. As I, as I told uh, one of the sponsors of of the bill, um, Congressman Dusty Johnson, I I'm still eating the bowl of Cheerios of the first. Bill, and I, so I don't quite know whether I'm going to be hungry for another bowl. Um, but I will say I can be a little more specific on your first point, which is the end to end. So the the current ocean shipping laws do give us jurisdiction over any container that comes from the water for international shipping or goes to it. So even under current law, even before OSRA, our authority didn't stop at the water's edge per se. That said, though, uh, as you know uh, so well, buddy, it is limited by the fact that we we can't find uh, you know railroad, we can't find 
uh, an interior facility. We're only allowed to find, you know, regulated entities, which are the three kinds of entities I described, basically uh, terminals, uh, the carriers, and, and then these intermediaries. And, and, and a lot of those different things are not considered intermediaries uh, by the law. So if you wanted us to be able to do that, and I think that's what your testimony basically said, then we would need more authority. But I will say this. My personal view is not that we need it. It's just that somebody needs it. I am happy as an agency to work with my friends at the Surface Transportation Board, for instance. And I have several friends on that, board, like personal friends I've gone back years and years with. Um, it, you know, it, and, and if, if they had the authority, I don't mind working with two agencies working together, particularly since we're both independent agencies. The problem is, is I don't think anyone has the authority. So in that sense, I do think legislation is needed, uh, whether it's needed to give us the authority. I know, I know I'm, I'm not supposed to say, oh, I, my agency doesn't need authority in bureaucracy school. We're all trained to grab more and more stuff. But, but I don't, it, it really doesn't matter to me as long as there's somebody I could turn to and work with. I mentioned all those agencies that regulate different things. We work with all of them uh, from time to time. That's fine. I mean, that's the way it's supposed to work, right? And, and the reason, you know, different agencies have different specialties. We don't have environmental specialists here. So I'm not mad that we don't do environmental regulation. That's not what we're supposed to do. I can work with others to find out if I need to find out. But that's the problem. So if you want to give it to us, that's up to you and the Congress. If, if they want to give it to someone else, that's fine, and we'll work with them. But somebody should have the ability to, to regulate, you know, uh, intermodal uh, shipping issues. Thank you, Jeremy. Thank you. All right, so Tommy, do you have a question? Uh, yes, I do. We, um, we, could give it, we could give it to the CFTC. Maybe the CFTC wants it. Anyway, go ahead. <laughs> go ahead with the next question. No, th thank you, Chairman Maffei. This is uh, Tommy Hayden. I'm uh, representing the Commodity Markets Council on the Ag Advisory Committee. I am the current chairman of American Cotton Shippers, and I've met with you several times along with my with Buddy. Um, and so I just really would like to follow on that and, and thank Chairman Benham for, for including you in this conversation. We did discuss, you know, during our last AAC meeting about how these supply chain disruptions do impact ag markets. I mean, they create shortages of supply, you know, long lead times, we lose sales, et cetera, et cetera. But I, I do want I do want to thank you and, and particularly your acknowledgement about the ag group's engagement with, with you during the you know OSRA uh, rulemaking process and and also acknowledging that you know although the supply chain issues have eased somewhat that there's still fundamental issues that need to be addressed. And and my point on that is really want to focus on chassis choice is something that we've been advocating for for a long time. And, and, and to really commend the administrative law judge's decision, realizing that that has been appealed by OSEMA, but regarding the exclusive agreements that prevent basically uh, merchant haulers from, um, from choice, from choice and, and picking their chassis. So didn't know if, if you had any comment on that or realizing that it's, it's probably an appeal that you may not be able to comment, but that's something that it definitely impacts ag shippers, and, and, and I just wanted to highlight here for the committee. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Tom. Um, uh, well, first of all, I do appreciate you, you acknowledging my shout outs. And, and frankly, I didn't, in a way, give you enough credit. I mean, uh, because, you know, particularly uh, there's a number of agriculture groups that really, you know, they, they both came to us at the FMC and to Congress, but also they went to the carriers, right? They didn't say, oh, you know, they didn't throw up their arms and say, well, there's nothing we can do, and et cetera. And they worked very constructively. Uh, um, and, uh, and frankly, I looked down at the, I'm not going to call anyone out, but I, I looked down at the list of participants in, on the, uh, and uh, it's many of you, which is, it shouldn't be a surprise because obviously you're involved in, in the CFTC's, uh, uh, advisory board but but that is part of the thing that the ability of these of farm groups to really you know to, to work within the system um and change but change while you're changing the system also um so i really do thank you for that um it, it, yeah you uh, so i do appreciate your comment uh because it is something that the fmc is looking at but uh we actually do have these dual roles of while we we do a lot of the policy we also, um, when something is appealed, when, when something comes to one of our administrative law judges and it's appealed, the first 
court of appeal, if you will, is the five of us commissioners. So because of that, I cannot comment on that particular uh, case. But believe me, I'm, you know, I'll be, I'll be very involved in looking at it. And, and uh, you know, once, once it, it does come to us, comes before us at the appropriate time, you'll obviously hear what I have to think. But I need to be able to consider the case, you know, as it is as an individual case without any uh, previous uh, uh, thoughts. I completely understand. Thank you. No, thank you. Any other questions from AAC members? Scott, I'm going to jump in. Um, Chairman Maffei, thanks for joining us. Um, this has been super helpful. And as I'm sure you share this with me, it, these are the moments that make me super happy that we could um, bring together folks from the administration um, and demonstrate, you know, obviously the, the fact that we're working together, but also that we have um, shared interests in terms of, you know, uh, our markets, who we oversee and who our stakeholders are, as you said, who our constituents are. Um, so I yeah. really appreciate uh, you taking the time. And it's great to see that we have that engagement ongoing with some of my members who have obviously been actively talking to you. Quick question before we wrap and, and let you go. Um, given that China is a huge uh, importer of U.S. Uh, agricultural goods, what do you have any thoughts, especially given the last few years, pre-COVID, COVID, the lockdown, anything from a China shipping perspective or ports perspective that you you all have to deal with um, in a narrow sense, or is it is it broader than just any one particular uh, jurisdiction? Uh, Chairman Benham, thanks for the question. I will answer that, but then I have a question for you. Yeah. Um, the uh, the the China port. So, um, well, I, I'm not going to say I'll, I'll answer the question because it's it's too. I mean, it's like there. I don't have a. I wish I had more answers, but I will address the question. Um, look, China. There's been a lot of talk about diversification of markets for importers. Right, that we've got to not just depend on China to make our manufacturing goods. Similar for exporters, of course. China should not be our only market. Now, that's not as big a deal for exporters because a lot of exporters have much more diversified markets. But you know, you're talking about some of the commodity, you know, big commodities. China is by far the biggest. We also can't give up on China, particularly as a trade partner. We are, you know, very, very linked with all sorts of trade ties. In the work that I do, um, I'm very cognizant of broader issues that involve China, right? I'm not going to, uh, you know, go to China if uh, if they're not, you know, if, if I feel like I just can't go because of broader issues. But in terms of the work that we do with the Chinese government, their maritime authority, um, they do have, there is a, a, a carrier uh, called a controlled carrier because it's it's largely owned by the Chinese government called called Costco, but we do regulate them and we subject to them to the same rules, the same restrictions um, as we do the other carriers. And I'll be honest with you, this is a reason not to give, you know, you say, oh, Chinese carriers, and I know there's a lot of skepticism, including for me, by the way, through the years, but Costco is one of the most improved in terms of exports. They're now um, exporting a higher percentage of the overall export market than they're doing imports in the import market. They're still doing far more imports than exports. That's just the nature of it. But but they have improved. So it's not that they're totally unresponsive. And I'll, I'll just sort of say that my thought, again, individually, me, not the Biden administration, not anybody else necessarily, but it's just we also can't give up on China. It's a very big and complex country. There's so much demand there for our agriculture. I mean, if you, if you, you know, just talk to somebody from China, talk to if you talk to anybody from the embassy, you have any sort of honest conversation. I mean, you know, and, and you know, it's true all over the world. And, and um, the, you know, that we both have an interest in getting more of our agricultural exports uh, into China. So, you know, we, we while at the same time, you know, we can be concerned about their leadership and some of their big positions. We, we, we also and, and while, while we all should diversify because the risk in anything is, you know, putting too many eggs in any basket is, is uh, too strong. We have to uh, we do have to continue to engage with China and understand how big a market that is, that is and is going to continue to be. I mean, maybe even bigger in the future. That's about the best I can do with that. I do have a question for you. So, so um, you know, I think I think all of you know. I mean, Chairman Benham, as I said, I think take the exact same 
attitude as we do here. I hope we do as well as he does in terms of serving constituents. But I didn't realize until recently that uh, he's got uh, not as many central New York roots as I do, but he certainly has family in central New York. And you go up to upstate New York and go to dairy farms every couple of years. Is that 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 right? Uh, that's absolutely right. And thanks to yeah. um, one of our members here, Dairy Farmers of America and Ed Gallagher, who uh, I make it a point to get up to Syracuse and um, do some trips along 90 <laughs> east now, and now, west of here, Syracuse so and my, even north and south of 83. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Here's my question. And Ed, you know, uh, so I um, so, you know, the thing is, is I figured when I became a congressman, I would get to milk a cow. And the problem, of course, it's not a problem. The cows are milked by machine, right? I mean, I mean, even even quote unquote a relatively small dairy farm. We're talking about you know thousands ahead, and uh, and so I've never milked a cow. Now I have milked a goat, but my question to you, Chairman Benham, is: Have you ever milked a cow? I've definitely milked a cow in Wisconsin, though, not in New York. So I've I've uh, milked well. Wisconsin cows, not <laughs> New York farms. But I'll make that a point on the the summer trip this year. I'll make sure. Well, uh, you, uh, you and I have to meet up because, like I said, I, I've never, I've never actually milked a cow by hand. I don't know how <laughs> one would do. All well, I know is it is, you know, just different from a goat. But uh, <laughs> you got to get your hands dirty. Yeah, yeah. So all of you should still be aware of us, city kids. That's, <laughs> uh, that's all I have to say. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Chairman. This was great. Um, I'm not seeing any. Thank other you. I am so sorry it didn't time. work out to come to come to you visually. Uh, but uh, you know, next time. Yeah. Continue to work together. Right. Appreciate all your work. Take Thanks. care. We have an open door. Thank right. you. Take Scott, care. I'll Bye. hand it back over to you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. So now that uh, the committee has had an opportunity to hear from all the different presenters, we'd like to open up the floor to take topics for the next meeting, which is scheduled for July 19th. Uh, certainly, we could change up the, based on the, the survey. I sent all you all July 19th is what we picked. And... Uh, so we'd love to hear topics, topic suggestions. And I would say if you submitted topics in December, like feel free to, to offer those same topics now, because we didn't, you know, we obviously didn't get to all the topics that were presented in December. Uh, if I may, um, I will uh, offer up, I, I think the CME is still moving forward with changing their span margining program um, and the way that's going to impact uh, margining of our commodity markets. So I still think a better understanding of that would be good of the span two margining. Thanks, Joe. Uh, Ed? Scott, as I listened to the uh, presentation around biofuels today, and particularly the carbon credits, um, the macro view of what's going on in the industry was particularly interesting. As it relates to the commission um, and its role in price discovery, um, digging deeper into getting those credits, which I guess would be assets and understanding the commission's role in in helping make public the price discovery process around those assets. And I don't know if that's going to require standardization or, but I, I do think that um, one of the panelists mentioned about how confusing kind of this myriad of uh, programs and credits and insets and offsets and all you know all of the but um from the perspective of of the commission and 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 uh derivative i think certainly has a role to play in price discovery and um you know on our way to uh a buck 50 a bushel would i think would change the world obviously in in the way we produce corn but uh i think maybe pulling on those uh, a little bit and getting deeper into the to the price discovery mechanism might be worth the, the uh, advisory committee's time. Okay, great, thanks. Joe, back to you. As a follow-up to that, there was a comment made about the new products that have been listed. 
And I'll tell you, I'm just learning about one. Um, ICE has listed a REN futures, <laughs> um, and I still don't know enough about it. And I would think the entire marketplace might like to learn about some of these new products that have been listed um, that go along with our um, push to be more green. Okay, great. And, and I should expand on the, the topic of uh, requests. If there's anything you would like us to expand on, I think, you know, Ed and, and Joe, like you're asking us to expand on biofuels, it sounds like a little bit, but if there are any other topics from prior meetings or, or you know, diving into a deeper discussion of topics today, certainly that's open as well for suggestions. Yeah, uh, possibly some more discussion on, you know, as far as as our exchanges go forward, uh, I think it's really important that we we ensure that that um, basic market information, uh, historical closes, daily daily settlements, that those all stay in front of paywalls. And I'd be interested in maybe a little more understanding of, you know, why some data is behind paywalls and what's how we're, how we're going forward to ensure that the public has access to all the da data that we have available. Thank you. Any, any other suggestions? And certainly folks can email either me or Swati after this meeting. You don't have to think of everything right now, but I guess I'm not seeing any other other comments and uh, just like to thank everyone for their participation today and as we uh, consider your suggestions for the next meeting we've heard a lot of informative insights today and and on the state of ag markets and issues affecting uh market participants in these markets and i'd like to thank all of you and the guest panelists for your participation and we look forward to the ongoing work of the aac and our next meeting in july now i'll turn it over to swati for closing remarks Thank you, Scott. I will now recognize Chairman Benham to give his closing remarks. Thanks, Swati. Um, not much to say. Great morning, uh, and I appreciate everyone's contributions. Those are really very diverse panels and discussions, but I think all important um, to have that conversation. And, and as Scott pointed out, I am here, we are here to elevate issues that are of importance to all of you. So, um, notwithstanding the few issues that were raised by Mark, Joe, and Ed, um, which are important, and we'll see what we can do to take those up and dig in a little bit deeper. As you do have uh, other things pop up, let us know. And this is the sort of genesis of what we're doing now. Good, efficient meeting today. We'll try to do one um, as is scheduled for July and then one towards the end of the calendar year. Uh, and I really <clears throat> do enjoy bringing folks in from other parts of the administration you know, Chairman Maffei's request and the invitation was, you know, really in response to some issues that, as Buddy pointed out, he and I had a discussion, um, you know, back uh, in the, the late fall and early winter, and in, in addition to Tommy as well. So if there are folks that we can bring in, even if it doesn't necessarily touch our direct markets or that there's policy that we can't necessarily implement, um, this is a, a forum to have a discussion to help improve American agriculture, production, uh, sale, shipping, and everything in between. So um, I wanna do whatever I can to facilitate these conversations um, so that we can across the board improve policy and make um, American agriculture stronger, better for uh, you know many, many years ahead, given all the challenges that we're facing uh, across the globe. So um, special thanks to Swati, Scott, you as well as chair, um, these things don't happen without your preparation um, and getting everyone on board and, and getting a, a, an agenda sketched out for us. And you did that uh, really well. And thanks to my commissioners for chiming in a little bit earlier um, at the beginning, but looking forward to the, the next meeting in July. And as always available if you guys need me, but um, best of luck and we'll talk to you soon. So Adi, I'll, I'll hand it over to you. Thank you, Chairman Benham. Thank you all to the AAC members and guest panelists for your participation at today's meeting. The meeting is now adjourned.